Uh, dear colleagues, welcome to this uh, episode of the uh, Instrument for Pre-Accession uh, Training and the new webinar. We're very happy to have you all uh, online today. Uh, we will uh, start by the first uh, session, which is on risk management plans. And uh, we will have Marin Banovac from EMA presenting uh, what we do at EMA, how we approach the um, risk management plans. And we will have other colleagues uh, complementing the view. And uh, as you know, what we do is we have a, a presentation with questions and with uh, trying to involve you in the discussion. And we will um, also a, um, have a, a, enough time for question and answer after the presentation. So prepare your question during the, the session. You have on your, um, on your a, uh, screen currently uh, the little technical things that we would like you to remember. So please, all of you, check that you are muted because background noise is really, uh, and I see, for example, uh, someone, who, yeah, thank you, uh, who was not muted. We will have background noise, which is uh, disrupting, and it's also creating echoes. So really check actively that you're muted. Uh, however, when you want to speak, please raise your hand, and we will give you the floor. We will identify you because we can see with raising hands, and we will give you the floor to ask your question. You can also put your question in the chat if you want, but a uh, talking is fine. Um, so, um, I think we will give, um, without further ado, the, the floor to Marine, um, and I will take Good the opportunity talk. to thank my colleagues who have been preparing this uh, webinar, uh, Clément with the, and uh, Sandra who are working behind the scene to make this happen, Perfect. and Dan with helping uh, from the technical perspective, and uh, a, of course Ricardo who has been uh, overseeing the, the preparation. So, Marin, I can give you the floor if you want. Thank you. Many thanks, and yes, uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, just a couple of words uh, about me. I, I work uh, at the EMA um, uh, as a risk management specialist. We're organized according to um, therapeutic areas at the EMA, and risk management as such at the EMA is rather a small community considering the size of, uh, of the agency and the amount of uh, uh, um, assessment reports flowing around. We are a group of around 10 uh, or 12, it depends, uh, depends on uh, you know, how it goes uh, with uh, people leaving and coming also. <clears throat> so um, obviously coming from uh, oncology therapeutic area, Somehow, I always uh, divert to, towards uh, uh, towards oncology and those examples. So, uh, forgive me for that. I'm trying to also include some other um, examples as as well. But on the other hand, um, the chances are that um, the likelihood is about sixty percent that when you assess something, you would assess oncology, considering the uh, the authorizations we uh, get at the EMA for the new products. Um, I understand that uh, uh, we have uh, many colleagues from uh, the countries, uh, from the pre-accession uh, countries. So just please allow me to say, drage kolegice, kolege, dobar dan. To those who who who, uh, who know me, uh, I, I, some of them I've, I've met uh, uh, back in the days when uh, Croatia was also in the uh, pre-accession uh, stage, and uh, uh, we, we really had uh, some uh, some nice discussions as well uh, on the risk management plan the plans back uh, back then. Um, I also see here in the um, in the um, uh, participants section uh, colleagues from from all over uh, the network uh, European Union. Uh, so just to say that uh, considering this uh, um, uh, event is aimed for the pre-accession assistance uh, uh, to the pre-accession countries, uh, the level of of uh, and the questions. And the, the whole material is kind of gauged towards uh, towards them. Uh, there are surely uh, very very experienced assessors on the line for who, who might find that uh, you know some examples are rather basic. But um, overall, uh, it was aimed uh, to provide um, uh, colleagues uh, in those uh, pre-accession member states with the advice and some kind of an 
algorithm how to as to how to approach um, uh, the assessment of uh, of risk management plans, and then take it as a as a backbone that you can build on. And and um, you know each assessor has their own ways of uh, uh, working with uh, risk management plans. So uh, there is no one way of of doing things. This is uh, something that uh, uh, works uh, works best uh, for me. So. That was a rather long intro. I'll, I'll just uh, give it to uh, to to the presentation. Oh, we um, we have uh, roughly half an hour for the presentation, and then after that, the plan is to really have an open and and uh, interactive um, discussion. Uh, I've prepared some uh, questions uh, on Slido that uh, we can uh, discuss. Uh, that are mostly related with the assessment of. Um, safety specification. Um, a few questions on how to how to um, approach uh, uh, safety concerns and manage them uh, through the um, uh, well the tools that that we have. Uh, anyway, so uh, I'd like to um, start with an overarching. Hello, uh, with an overarching. Um, uh, a statement uh, which which I think is 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 good to to bear in mind, and uh, that is that uh, prior to to um, assessing the RMP and reading the risk management plan as proposed uh, by the applicant, um, it is it is useful to start uh, actually go into the clinical safety data uh, of the dossier first. So try to uh, form your opinion. Uh, like a high level opinion about uh, what concerns you um, would see you, you, you identify about the product uh, before you actually uh, open the, the risk management plan. And uh, so, so as not to simply get biased. Otherwise, uh, if you start directly from the RMP, then you actually check really uh, what uh, the applicant said and, uh, and uh, start mm -hmm. from there. Uh, we in this uh, in this session we really uh, started from uh, the, the not the ground level but from the assumption that you've already assessed some RMPs uh, you have some experience to a certain degree so the definitions will not be um, um, repeated of course but we, we don't have time but uh, just on the highest level of the whole risk management plan when you start assessing it you have to focus on three. Uh, three main points. That's the safety specification stating, laying down the list of uh, safety concerns, which is important to identify important potential risks and missing information. Secondly, pharmacovigilance plan, pharmacovigilance, which effectively means pharmacovigilance um, studies. Uh, and uh, then lastly, the risk minimization measures. Uh, studies, of course, will uh, address the characterization uh, uh, further characterization or identification of uh, the risks, whereas risk minimization measures as such are very, um, very pragmatic, practical tools um, about uh, how to uh, how, about how to go about uh, a safety concern. And uh, there, I'm listing just a few here because uh, these are not all. Uh, for the routine, we have product information and some questionnaires, and then for the additional, there's uh, educational materials of all sorts and forms, uh, patient alert cards, uh, and so on, so on and so forth. Uh, I'm just reiterating this because there will be examples later. So you just uh, um, we are all on the same level in terms of in terms of the vocabulary, the dictionary that we're using uh, for for later. So um, as I mentioned, it's 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 worth uh, starting from. Uh, the clinical safety summary from uh, the clinical safety part of uh, the the dossier when um, when approaching a risk management plan. Um, it, if uh, uh, if you're really uh, going into the details, of course that that you will dig down further. But a lot of data already is covered in the clinical safety summary in the common technical document. You will find it in uh, module two point seven four. Um, and just by by eyeballing the um, um, uh, the tables that you can find there, you will already get a, a high level uh, overview of the safety profile uh, of of the drug. And um, 
there it's uh, easy to to really compare what what was going on in the control group and what happened uh, with the with the active because uh, the the way that th those are presented is is really really so obvious. There are columns comparing uh, the uh, absolute numbers and and percentages uh, in one group after the other, and then there's also statistics next to it whether uh, the difference was statistically significant. So. Uh, uh, there, uh, just as a high-level uh, approach, when you're screening the safety concerns before going into the detail of, of each of them, uh, focus on uh, whatever is grade three adverse events from the clinical um, trials program or higher, uh, this is especially um, um, applicable to oncology where we are of course, willing to accept a higher level of uh, toxicity uh, due to the uh, uh, very severe uh, indications that uh, patients are being treated for. Um, but for non-oncology uh, indications, uh, perhaps uh, somewhat lower grade adverse events uh, uh, could, could also be taken into account, uh, considering uh, the, uh, the, the benefit and risk uh, uh, ratio in, in those indications, right? So, uh, that's where you would, uh, just by looking at, at this data in uh, the clinical safety part of the dossier, where you could uh, see which other events of higher grade were overrepresented, um, focus on oh, those other events that led to helping the treatment. Uh, this, is, uh, this is very important that were experienced led to um, uh, stopping the treatment temporarily, and then during the tr clinical trials program, you can uh, identify that some clinical uh, supportive measures were implemented uh, and the, uh, the subjects were continued on the product that will later on translate uh, um, into the risk minimization, into advice or warnings or uh, some kind of precautionary um, uh, measure statements in the, um, uh, in the product information. So, uh, it's very important to uh, to to focus uh, on on those uh, adverse events of high grade uh, that are very uh, severe and important for the benefit risk, and see if they uh, were managed and in what way they were managed, so that we can uh, translate that uh, later on into into practice, into risk, proper risk minimization um, um, advice uh, or, or management. Uh, Another another hint is, of course, to, to look at the adverse events of special interest. They are uh, especially useful because that means that the uh, those are the ones that um, the um, uh, that the applicant had already identified. Uh, and of course, there's there's definitely a reason why they why they've identified it. So they are uh, definitely uh, red flags for. Uh, to be focused, uh, to be focused on, and they often translate into the, uh, the important uh, um, identified and important potential uh, potential risks. Um, moving on, um, of course, uh, we always need to keep uh, keep an eye or, or, or keep in our minds the impact of uh, the adverse drug reaction. Uh, on the benefit uh, risk balance, therefore the discussions uh, whether the product is oncology or non-oncology uh, makes uh, makes a difference. I'm just uh, mentioning that uh, in view of, of some examples that later we will have. Um, consider whether uh, the uh, adverse reaction was reversible, whether it was dose dependent, what, was, what the time to onset was. Um, and whether the uh, effect of um, of the adverse reaction uh, waned uh, over time, even if the patient was maintained uh, on the on the product uh, in, in in the trials. Uh, so again, this translates into direct advice uh, and warnings uh, for the for the practitioners, for the patients, uh, for the patients later. There are many examples. Uh, uh, like that, where at the beginning of of treatment, uh, the patient experiences um, the uh, the adverse event and then uh, reaction, and then and then continues uh, taking the drug without uh, being de challenged and and gets uh, gets better. Uh, Vilenia is is one example like that with uh, the slowing of the heart rate. Uh, 
Um, if if you have a suspicion on um, uh, something from the clinical trials that you've identified that that you uh, consider for inclusion as a safety concern in the list of safety concerns later, uh, it's worth going back also to to the non-clinical again, uh, not necessarily to uh, you know boil down to the nitty gritty and and, and detailed assessment. Uh, um, so, as I said, uh, perhaps worth looking into non-clinical findings as well into the battery of, of uh, experiments there because uh, you can get the confirmation if you have um, uh, if you have a tra uh, trace if you can trace the adverse event uh, already from uh, the, the basic pharmacology even back to non-clinical findings and then finally again in in a clinical trials program that. Uh, then you have sufficient data to say, okay, this is identified. Now, being identified as such uh, does not necessarily mean that it's important. We can say that the risk applies, but the importance of that, that risk is uh, a matter for, for assessment and discussion. It's not perhaps that difficult to identify it. what we need to do um, as, uh, as regulators really is to assess what the importance of, of those risks uh, is for the individual patient or perhaps for, for public health in that regard. Um, it goes without saying that um, the uh, uh, embryo toxicity, developmental toxicity require special attention. We know how, um, we know how pharmacovigilance started with the thalidomide tragedy and uh, uh, that's something we should never lose uh, from, from our side. So uh, this data should be looked into um, always with uh, very close attention to detail, just like exposure in pregnancy and, and lactation. Um, so uh, moving on to the, the missing information. Uh, uh, after the uh, amendment of uh, the uh, GVP-5 uh, um, uh, guidelines, so guideline on, on risk management plans, um, uh, many, many changes have happened in terms of how risk management plans are both uh, um, uh, done, both created and uh, assessed. But one of, uh, one of the most uh, sometimes difficult um, uh, parts of the assessment that caused somewhat confusion um, or that that's the way it came across uh, to, to to us uh, was part the part on the missing information um, because the uh, paradigm about missing information had had really changed uh, with the revision two of of the GVP so to say that just the fact that uh, the information is uh, is not um, uh, available um, at the time of the assessment uh, that doesn't constitute uh, missing information per se. Uh, here, we generally talk about those patients who, um, uh, or su subjects who are not uh, exposed to the product due to hepatic impairment, uh, renal impairment, most often um, uh, older uh, age groups. Uh, and uh, previously, uh, these would automatically be included as missing information uh, simply because, by the logic of things, the information was missing, right? But um, the, as I said, the paradigm has changed uh, into uh, really something that, that boils down to to one uh, question. Thank you. Um, which really boils down to to one question, uh, either simple or complicated. But uh, the, the question is really: Can we anticipate? that the safety profile uh, in the specific populations which were excluded or missing from the clinical trials uh, will, will differ from, from the main population. And um, this is not always uh, straightforward. If we don't have the information, how can we then really anticipate any on, based, on, based on what can we do that? So if generally the answer to, to the above question is yes, then uh, these would usually qualify for inclusion as uh, missing information. Uh, I will get back to uh, missing information and addressing them uh, in the pharmacovigilance plan uh, uh, at some um, later slides as well. Um, 
but I just wanted to to highlight this uh, this point here because we received a lot of uh, questions following the amendment uh, of uh, of the guideline, uh, also through Ask EMA um, uh, service. So uh, industry uh, was very keen on on clarifying what they should include or should not include in the missing information, as well as the um, uh, the assessors. And so. Let's uh, let's go through one quick example. Um, uh, now that we've covered the uh, very high level um, safety safety specification uh, and uh, missing information for a multiple myeloma uh, product, uh, monoclonal or so biological, um, this is uh, this is this is a, a concrete example of what happened during the the assessment. Uh, I could not disclose the the name of the product, but I think the information. Uh, here is pretty uh, pretty much enough uh, multiple myeloma and a biological. So the this is what came uh, came in uh, from the applicant um, as to what the safety concerns are and missing information. So as you see, the list uh, is is rather long. We tend to uh, over the past few years have uh, uh, lists of safety concerns which are uh, shorter uh, or uh, containing less. Uh, safety concerns than um, than what you can see on screen. And the reason for that and the, the whole uh, change in, in the guideline was really that uh, so that uh, we focus on what is important. There is no point in having laundry lists of safety concerns uh, just, just listed uh, without any action. Risk management plan as such is there to really facilitate action uh, and uh, uh, further characterization of management of safety concerns. If you, as an assessor, tomorrow do not plan any action to, to take any action on the safety concerns listed or missing information, then it should generally not be uh, listed uh, in this table, which is uh, kind of the fundament of, of the whole uh, risk management plan for, for later. And this is what we ended up what we ended up uh, after the assessment. So you can see that um, a, a very high number, very high percentage uh, to be precise uh, of uh, the safety concerns and, uh, and missing information was uh, in the end taken out uh, from, uh, fr from, from, this, uh, from this list. Moving on to the final vigilance plan. Um, uh, a final vigilance plan, on, on the one hand, is uh, is there to, as I said, uh, further characterize uh, further characterize the risks. Uh, but um, when we discuss final vigilance plans within the network, categorization of the studies also plays uh, plays an important uh, important role. As, at the first glance, you might uh, think, what characterization does does that really make any difference? Is it just a bureaucratic? Exercise, but actually it has quite uh, profound implications on um, post-marketing uh, life cycle of the product, as well as on the fact whether the uh, applicant will get a condition uh, or or not. So uh, one and two would category three uh, is uh, full MA without without conditions. So. As, as assessors, you need to check the objectives of the proposed studies and uh, really make sure that the, those objectives are aligned with the safety concerns. Uh, it, it happens more often than not that the company lumps um, uh, uh, safety concerns into studies that are not made or not tailored for, for those safety concerns. So make sure that uh, the study is uh, suited for for purpose that it makes really um, uh, that ad it addresses the questions. Right. Uh, another uh, very important point, especially lately and more and more so over the years with the, the advent of uh, big data, um, uh, is the registries and uh, 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 what kind of registries to use. So. Uh, uh, We've had numerous examples where the companies were proposing their uh, registries, and that is what seems to be the preference from the companies. It's probably easier for them to set up their own registry with their uh, CROs that they work with, rather than uh, approaching an existing um, clinical 
uh, sites and registries that are there. But uh, just as a steer, as guidance for you, uh, uh, the network is is uh, going towards asking for the uh, disease registries rather than product registries, uh, so that we can have. Um, uh, more reproducible results that that the registries that are being used for one product, if possible, are used as well for the next products in class, or not necessarily for the class, but for the disease, for the treated patients, uh, for for many reasons. So that's an important part to to look at, look out whether the company is proposing a product registry, and if there are existing disease registries. Um, but preferably in Europe. We like to have the data coming from Europe, uh, but not exclusively, right, of course. Uh, and the motivation of the study, whether it's efficacy or safety, this guides the decision as to whether the study is a um, post-authorization efficacy study or a safety study. Um, on an RMP level, in terms of where it goes, it's part three or part four. Uh, but this also has implications on who's going to assess it. So uh, the CHMP will be in charge for uh, the efficacy studies, of course, and the PRAC4 post authorization um, uh, safety studies. So it's it's good to clarify that right from the outset during the assessment. Um, again, uh, as mentioned, uh, whether the study is important for benefit, uh, risk, or how important it is, how uh, uh, important it is for the benefit risk, will it shift the benefit uh, risk balance towards the benefit if the results uh, um, are provided, uh, that's, that's an important part to take into, into account. Uh, if uh, the study does not address um, the safety concerns, doesn't change the, our, our knowledge on the product, it will not move the benefits risk in either direction, so it's, it's essentially useless. So that, therefore, um, in the discussion part, this is really now um, a very, very practical thing on how to draft the assessment reports, uh, because we have to review them and, and uh, uh, we see many things uh, in the assessment where um, uh, studies are sometimes just uh, mentioned uh, as, as a fact of life in the assessment report, which is not optimal. Uh, if uh, a study is required, it's really good that and absolutely needed that uh, the justification for the inclusion of the study is is well uh, well put uh, in in the in the assessment report. So um, this is on the side of the PRAC rapporteur uh, because the pharmacovigilance plan is in the full uh, is the responsibility of the PRAC rapporteur. So uh, hence this um, uh, this illustration here. Uh, any prior information on the study, any prior discussions also should be reflected in the assessment report and then moved on uh, from there for the justification as to why the study is needed. Um, when it comes to the missing information in special populations, uh, I just wanted to, to highlight uh, another example where uh, when it comes to the studies, we can use the existing studies uh, which are proposed by the applicant for another purpose. Normally, uh, phase one, two studies, PK studies, are um, they're not really really desirable or desirable to be to be included in the uh, in the pharmacovigilance plan. We like to see uh, proper observational studies there, but uh, in certain instances there may be a PK studies which will be investigating dose response relationship. Um, uh, so their objective is dose response, but they will be conducted in patients, for instance, with hepatic impairment or a renal impairment, and we can piggyback on those studies and include those in, uh, phar in the pharmacovigilance plan. They would be category three studies in this case. Uh, uh, this is not a rule, but there are instances where PK studies can be useful in this regard, and then uh, they can be included in the PV, in the PV plan, right? So, um, in this example, uh, safety in special populations was, in, was initially requested to be removed by the rapporteur on the basis of renal and hepatic impairment not being primarily safety issues, but uh, uh, multiple myeloma uh, as such um, has kidney disease as a complication. And we have to take into account that this is fourth line therapy 
uh, in, in which case these patients would have developed uh, kidney disease. Therefore, it's really useful to know uh, how the, the drug performs or what the drug does to the body um, uh, in patients with, um, with renal impairment. So, so it's a nuanced approach. And uh, we need to take into account not just the indication, but also the line of therapy uh, and the status, uh, the overall status of the patient uh, that would be given uh, the drug at the time. Moving on to um, the risk minimization part quickly. Uh, again, a very, a very practical, um, I decided to go for the practical example rather than, than some um, uh, academic uh, discussion on this really. Uh, so, for um, if if you have um, a, a list of products which uh, already have additional risk minimization uh, measures uh, included, for instance, for checkpoint inhibitors, uh, then the question is really: if you have the fourth uh, product in the same class, will you uh, will you uh, impose um, uh, edu educational materials or additional? risk minimization measures or not. Uh, in this case, the educational, well, the additional risk minimization measure we are talking about is a patient alert card. So looking at, at this slide, looking at the fact that we have a patient alert card for the already existing three products in the class, the question is sort of nonsensical. Do we need a fourth one? Well, if the three products have a patient alert card included, then the fourth one should have it. Um, but uh, you will see that in the next uh, example, where we're going to have the same products, um, so the same class of products, it might also depend on the type of additional risk minimization measures. For instance, in the first part, we discussed patient alert card, where it makes sense that every patient receives patient alert card because for any of them, the drug that they receive might be the first time they are receiving. For, for a patient, for an individual, the fact that there's a class of drugs out there on the market doesn't really mean much for, they, for them. The, the, the product that they are taking for their uh, um, uh, uh, disease, for their illness, is the, might be the first one. So uh, they, need, they need a patient alert card in, uh, in, that, in that sense. But, on the other hand, we take the same products and the novel drug of the same class coming uh, to the market. The question whether the prescribers need educational materials is something uh, something debatable, really. Uh, we need to take into account that the landscape changes and the, the clinical practice evolves over time. So if, if there's been 10 years since the authorization of, of the first product in class, the safety concerns have become more, um, more, more, not more common in the sense, but they, they've become more known uh, amongst the physicians. And um, sometimes there's simply no need to, to overwhelm them with more educational materials and, and uh, more, more uh, papers or whatever pamphlets are, are being used to, to communicate because they really know it. Uh, and there, I'll have another example uh, of this uh, later on. So again, a nuanced approach. It doesn't. It, it's not a one size fits all. But uh, Marine, kind of Marine, a... I think about a, uh, also giving the time for for the discussion, please. So because absolutely yeah. yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, no, take, take into account. Um, so uh, this is again uh, really quickly on linking the discussion on clinical safety with RMP. Clinical safety and risk management are. Uh, it's something that, that's really integrated, and uh, that's why I started off from, you know, taking into account that uh, before looking into the RMP, you look at some clinical uh, safety data, not some, but as much as, much as, as possible. And the clinical safety, which is in the domain of the CHMP, translates later on uh, into the parts of the risk management plan, which are shared between the CHMP uh, and uh, the PRAC. Be pragmatic, be clear about the questions. Uh, sometimes less is more, but sometimes more is really more. This is an example of uh, uh, a question that was posed to the applicant where 
the applicant was requested to specify the milestones for the study that they proposed. After further discussions uh, with the rapporteur, um, um, it was it became clear that it's not really just the milestones that we are uh, more interested in. There's plenty of other uh, um, issues that the applicant needs to address. So be clear in the question, the clearer you are towards the applicant, the, the better responses you get and the less rounds of assessment uh, uh, we, we will have. So it's worth really uh, be, being clear on the, on the questions. Try to form your high level looking into the before you start assessing it. Once you've defined uh, what your safety concerns are, contrast them with the definitions from the guideline. Make sure that the discussions are carried over from the clinical safety part through the risk management uh, part of uh, the assessment report. Mind, take, uh, don't forget that uh, these will all end up in the EPAR, the public, European Public Assessment Report. And uh, you can be, uh, well, we as EMA will always uh, be called for uh, so as to what is written in the assessment report. So we need this to be really, uh, really clear. Uh, of course, taking into account previous examples when deciding on risk minimization measures on pharmacovigilance studies as to whether they're needed or not. Uh, this is also pretty clear. And keep the practical aspect in mind. How will your questions translate into better risk characterization, risk minimization? Uh, try to stay away from purely academic questions that will not impact product information, benefit risk balance in the end, or that are unanswerable. Ask answerable questions. Um, so I think that's that's that, that concludes the uh, the. First part, which was the presentation. Um, now we can go, uh, I guess uh, we can go two ways. I have one example, which- Maybe, maybe Marine, let's make a break on the presentation type. And we, we ask people if they have questions and clarification first, and then we can go to the, uh, the further question that you have. And also yeah. your, your colleagues want to, Maybe clarify your point, uh, or we'll take maybe some of the answers in the in the questions. So, uh, dear colleagues, do you have questions? So please raise your hand, or take the floor, or put it in the chat. Whatever is more comfortable for you. But a, uh, if you have clarification, or if you want a uh, some point maybe to be explained further, just uh, raise your hand. Thank you. You know that you can do that by uh, pointing to your name, and you will see a hand. You just click on it. Maja Stanković from Montenegro. Dragi Marine, ovaj veliko hvala na ovoj prezentaciji. Mnogo mi je drago ovaj da te vidim i čujem. Dear Marine, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. And uh, I'm from Montenegro, from National Competent Authority. And uh, my question is uh, with regards to um, implementation of uh, um, uh, conducted uh, risk minimization uh, measure, uh, actually with regard to uh, effectiveness, implementation, uh, evaluation of effectiveness of uh, risk minimization measures, especially on uh, a local level, because uh, um, uh, as a candidate country and in accordance with the uh, Montenegrin law on medicines, for centrally authorized uh, products, we have uh, the uh, uh, marketing authorization uh, holders submit to us uh, EU risk minimization plans. And uh, um, the obligation for marketing authorizations for products uh, which are, uh, for which are uh, requested conducted of additional risk minimization measures is to implement them in Montenegro. But, it is very important for us uh, to the uh, MAH um, uh, conduct um, uh, actually um, uh, evaluation of effectiveness of these implemented risk immunization uh, measures. So, may I kindly of ask for your uh, interpretations or answers for this question? Well, that's that's uh, absolutely what the the guideline states. Really, that uh, the the studies that are 
uh, being conducted should uh, their effectiveness should be should be followed up or the, the effectiveness of whatever the uh, sorry not the studies the the effectiveness of the implemented education materials should be um, uh, should be followed up with 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 a study. Uh, one, so how you can uh, apply that locally uh, is um, is a tricky question, but uh, what what is most often the case is that the studies on the effectiveness of uh, educational materials are conducted in a handful of, of countries, which we then um, usually extrapolate on, on other member states. Um, and during the assessment, the um, uh, we are trying to find a representative uh, sample of uh, the, the countries where the company should um, test the, the, the effectiveness of the educational materials. So uh, the, the usual um, uh, question there, if whenever possible, is that we have um, geographical representation that the, the, the company follows the uh, not just the geographical, but also the population size, the uh, diversity of healthcare uh, systems. So sometimes uh, it's a non-issue, and one country can can provide a study in one country can provide uh, enough information for, for for the others. Sometimes we need half a dozen uh, countries, uh, but in, in any case, I think it's rare to find that the. Um, a study on on the effectiveness of, uh, of education materials of risk minimization will be conducted all across Europe. So my my short answer to to you, Maya is that um, uh, perhaps you don't need uh, the study to be conducted in in uh, Montenegro necessarily when you can when you can use the data available uh, uh, from from the network or perhaps uh, uh, done previously. I mean, it all comes with a caveat. The you know the the landscape changes. If the study is old, maybe it's not it's not that applicable. Um, but that's the general the general steer that that's that's taken uh, by by the track. I don't know if I hope this answers your question. If not, let me know. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you very much. I think that this is the more uh, rational approach, uh, actually. And uh, uh, are these uh, uh, studies for uh, evaluation of risk uh, effectiveness of risk minimization uh, level on EU uh, in new member states? Are there uh, actually uh, post authorization safety studies? Well, these uh, studies were. Uh, if, um, taking into uh, consideration the definition of uh, uh, PAST. Yeah, these studies would fall under category three uh, uh, post authorization studies, right? Uh, they would uh, not form um, uh, conditions to the MA. They are not considered that uh, valuable for the interpret for for the assessment of of uh, benefit risk. Uh, now, the the uh, addition of safety study, it, it, bottom line, it is all safety. But uh, I think what really matters here is that we categorize them um, as category three studies, meaning they are required, but they are not conditions to the MA. They are assessed uh, by the PRAC, and uh, that's uh, that's really the gist of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hvala, Marine. Una. Thank you very much. Um, can we, do we have all the questions, uh, all the clarifications at this point in time? Anybody wants to intervene? If not, maybe Marine, you can continue with your example. Very well, thank you. And if there's any questions in the meantime, just uh, please let me know. Um, uh, I took. Um, I wanted to take one one example about the safety concerns. Uh, I think this is really really an important an important part because that's what we build uh, build everything on, and uh, uh, it's it's worth discussing it. So you know, please uh, give your comments, uh, shout your comments uh, over the microphone, or put them in the chat. Uh, uh, um, just to say, this is not a one size fits all, and no one can say that they are 100% right, nor can uh, we be sure what the PRAC would decide in each and, and every case. We don't have 100% consistency on, uh, on the decisions taken for the safety concerns. Uh, so I, Took out an example uh, of uh, of a product. Uh, we could not. We were told not to disclose any commercially confidential information. So I tried to provide some some information for you to to take into account uh, about the product and and see where it where it takes. So 
So this is a chemical product. Uh, it's it's a very rare indication in oncology uh, for uh, GI cancers. And uh, the onset is as, uh, starting from 45 years of age and, and older, usually. Um, there are no available treatments. Uh, average life expectancy is two years, all right? Um, this is the perhaps the, the most important set of information. There's, of course, there, there should be much more, but we, we can't go uh, into that. Now, um, uh, the question, let's, let's focus on first the important identified risks for these products. We have neutropenia, we have GI disorders, we have renal impairment and acute pancreatitis. So let's just focus on, on, on these for the moment, uh, for this product. Uh, any comments on what, how you would assess uh, this proposal coming from the applicant? I'll give you some time and, and please put your comments or take the microphone. Mm -hmm. Adimira, you want to ask your question? Adimira, you need to unmute yourself. After all the recommendation to mute, this time you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> okay, we cannot hear. So maybe you can put your question in the chat and we'll, Marin will answer. Or your colleagues, Marin, you also give your floor to your colleagues depending on the area. You know better that they, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I mean, this is something to, to have a little think about. So I'm just trying to allow colleagues to, to, to have a to, to have a think uh, about it. You can write in the, in the chat very quickly which of these four you would keep or which of these four safety concerns you would remove, taking into account the, the information that you have in the heading of, of the example. Yes, very good. You need to work, my dear colleagues. So please write in the chat your solutions and your views. Hello. Hi, Marin. Hello. Thanks from Montenegro. <laughs> I hi, hi. just would like to comment, I would maybe remove gastrointestinal disorders because of the indication is also related to gastrointestinal oncology issues and this is maybe not identified risk. Mm -hmm. And um, what do you think about this uh, link between, well, we have acute pancreatitis, obviously uh, an important safety concern, and GI disorders. Um, obviously, GI disorders as such are very general. Acute pancreatitis is very focused and streamlined. So, um, yeah, I would I would agree with 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 your comment and say I would go with removing GI disorders when we have one of the most severe uh, um, GI disorders already listed there and. Uh, just stating GI disorders is very, very general. Uh, how will how will GI disorders as such help uh, us in minimizing the risk? Or what what are we really thinking when we say GI disorders? So maybe we can start from uh, the neutropenia um, here from uh, top down. Is it fibrile neutropenia? Does it lead to serious infections? Um, and then. We need to make this connection. We have neutropenia here as important identified. Then we have infections as important potential risk. Now, I mean, what we need to consider when assessing safety concerns is what is the clinical impact? What, what is the, how this affects the patient uh, himself or herself? And neutropenia is, uh, of course, associated with infections. So um, the question is, does this, what grade of neutropenia this was, was it manageable, was it, uh, what, what grade uh, it was, and does it lead to infections? So that's something to, to consider. Going to the GIs, an indication is gastrointestinal cancer. Are these the complica complications of the disease, and why is acute pancreatitis uh, singled out, just as, as uh, you mentioned, right? Um, Colleagues, there's no right or wrong. If you want to, you know, engage, please do. If not, I can continue discussing this. Uh, I have some more uh, notes here. 
Please continue, Marine, but I, I'm trying to encourage people to uh, also put their own views on what is important. So we get yeah. sort of active engagement. You remember that these IP webinars are of value because you say what you would do, how you would approach a thing. It's, it's about you. It's not about EMA. That's okay. Well, I'll, I'll just continue. Whoever feels uh, um, chatty, please do. <laughs> Uh, maybe, um, uh, maybe uh, just Marin, uh, uh, this uh, shortened DDI is. I'm sorry, that's uh, drug drug interactions. Uh -huh. drug, drug interactions. Sorry, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, um, let's just discuss the, the renal impairment. Uh, renal and hepatic impairment per se are not risks, uh, they are more like risk factors for uh, developing. Um, uh, adverse reactions, which are the, the consequence of accumulation of, of toxicities, so uh, of the product and then toxicities. So, uh, renal impairment, uh, first of all, it doesn't say much. We, we should talk about use of uh, use in renal impaired patients. And as mentioned, this would normally, on average, constitute a missing information if that's, that's relevant, rarely. Renal impairment, as such, is an identified risk. Uh, but as well, uh, we, we should actually talk about damage to the kidneys uh, rather than renal impairment. If we are talking about the uh, uh, effects on on the, the systems of the body systems, right? So renal impairment being an identified risk, not likely to be included here. It doesn't make that much uh, that much sense. Um, drug drug interactions. DDIs, the guidance coming from, um, well, from the guideline, obviously, is that uh, ideally we should um, state what toxicities we expect from the DDIs as such. So if we can, which is not always possible, but if, if, if we can, then it's good to, to provide more concrete wording, wording uh, what are the expected consequences. Usually we uh, end up with a high level uh, increased toxicity um, uh, due to uh, drug drug interactions. And if we can add a specific drug, which is normally concomitantly given with the product in question, then, um, uh, then it's good to, to state them. But DDIs are most often stated as DDIs, not ideal, but that's where we are. For, uh, for a monoclonal uh, antibody, we normally don't have them. For, uh, but, but because this is a chemical product, uh, then they are they are stated here by um, by example, right? And then and then uh, going to the um, to the last, uh, but we could continue discussing this uh, to to a really broad extent. Long term use, we need to go back to the heading of uh, or you know the narrative of the question, which is that the life expectancy uh, here. Uh, for these patients is uh, sadly only only two years. Um, and the question then one has to ask uh, themselves is, uh, is uh, long-term use really worth uh, including as missing information for when, um, when, when median survival um, is, is less than two years um, for, these, for these patients, okay? Um, also, we can mention use in pediatric patients, considering that onset is 45 years of age, uh, also makes, doesn't make much sense. Uh, use in pregnancy and nursing mothers, considering the uh, demographics uh, of the patient population, again, uh, something, something to think about, uh, perhaps not as relevant, uh, probably not. So uh, I think, I think this uh, concludes uh, this, uh, this example. Uh, anyone, anyone having uh, questions, comments on on this? Maybe they would keep something that we said we would remove. Okay. Um, one one we, question I, from Joanna. Yeah. Yes, hello. Thank you for a very nice presentation. I was just wondering about the long term use. We don't really know what new therapies will come up next year, uh, which might increase the life expectancy for, for the disease in, in question. Should you have that in mind in 
in the, in the cases when you what what additional um, therapies might come up? Yeah, I think I think the answer is really uh, if we have a good indication that something is in the pipeline. But generally, if if we go along along uh, that line of thinking, uh, then we uh, I guess we could we could always include long term use, right? Um, so um, if RMP uh, is is an evolving living living document, and um, unless we have a, a good indication of uh, uh, landscape to change in in the near future, I would stick with the uh, you know uh, the data at hand, what what we have uh, at the time of of assessment, and uh, make any changes uh, subsequently in the light of of the new data. Um, it is up to the MAH to propose the changes, but of course these can come from um, from from us as regulators, of course. So I would say the answer is uh, we have to be based on the data, and uh, perhaps if we really have indication of uh, uh, something changing quickly, then yeah, on the assumption of that. But I would I would not be inclined to to include long term use uh, if. Uh, the data on if the data is such and uh, we don't expect that you know the life expectancy would suddenly um, be extended really significantly. Yeah, Marin, but if the product is, for example, ex uh, the product indication is to extend the life and to prolong survival, that would make sense. So depending on the product, this may be more relevant in some cases than maybe the one that you've chosen where the product may be only uh, symptomatic or palliative. Depending on the product, you may consider the yeah. different thing because if it's supposed to increase the life expectancy by uh, several years then long term use makes sense absolutely i mean th that makes all the sense of course the uh, I, I think the um the underlying assumption uh, for me building this example is uh the margins that we have in oncology you know uh the uh, for for um, cancers uh, gi cancers with uh, the short life expectancy, we, we normally see the extensions of, of life expectancy by really narrow, small margins. So that was the leading thought when when uh, when doing the example. If if for instance this uh, product in question would would uh, be expected to prolong uh, the life expectancy from two years to four years, that would be um, you know. To like 100% uh, something that we haven't seen in oncology, I think, uh, in one product uh, or for one uh, indication ever. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We have a question on pregnancy and fertility, and I will have uh, some word about that because you, you mentioned thalidomide at the beginning of your presentation, and I think we need to move away from the fear of thalidomide. Not every product is thalidomide. Even thalidomide did not result in 100% a, uh, you know, a uh, pro 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 problem. So I'm not saying that it was nothing, but it's, we need to move to a, a benefit risk approval of medicine for pregnant women. And we see more and more women will get a late pregnancy in their 40s. So it's not totally irrelevant to think about pregnancy. Again, that's not maybe the best example, but I think we, what we need is to make sure that we have good reason for a developing in, in pregnant women, but by default, we should think that we must get the data. Pregnant women will get medicines, and they can get cancer. If they survive, they will may want to be pregnant. So we always say pregnant women may become sick, may become sick, and uh, sick women may become pregnant. And I think that situation covers a lot of, of uh, cases where we haven't been good. We have always excluded women to protect them. But what we do is we expose them to the disease, untreated disease only. We don't think about the benefits of the treatment. And I think we need to review our position on pregnancy for, for these women. Uh, sorry, I'm taking a little bit the, the, way, the text away from the risk management part. But I think in terms of thinking of pregnancy, we cannot just think about the risk. We need to think about also about the benefits. Over back to you. Yeah, the the point absolutely. The the point uh, there was really that uh, assessment of uh, embryo fetal developmental toxicity and so on is is one of one of the tick boxes that an assessor has to have 
uh, in in their mind when when assessing it, right? Now, what the outcome is, that's another another story altogether, depending on on you know so many so many factors. But uh, that that is one of the you know top priorities. How does the drug affect uh, uh, the the fetus, uh, pregnancy, lactation, and so on? Just it's something that a pre presentation on really RMP cannot avoid. We have to mention. <laughs> Uh, I see a question in the chat. Let me just uh, let me just uh, have a read. I think it's uh, a follow up of the first question, actually, on pregnancy. Yeah. Uh, I would just here. I would like to uh, uh, invite, uh, if if they they are willing, uh, Maria, uh, my colleagues Maria Santos and Maria Joanna Sata, if they would like to uh, uh, to take a question, perhaps on uh, pregnancy missing information, because they. Uh, uh, originally actually had some really good examples on exposures in, in pregnancy. So, uh, Maria, Maria Giovanna, would you like to take the floor for this question? Um, good day, this is Maria Giovanna. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, if I may, I would like to make a comment and give an example. So it's a product, I guess, uh, we have all come across because uh, there have been uh, procedures at EU level such a referral. And uh, taking uh, into account Agnes' comment, I would mention Valpro-8 and the benefit of uh, Valpro-8 treatment. Um, Valpro-8, you know, is uh, widely authorized uh, it has been authorized for a really long time for the treatment of bipolar disorders, uh, manic episodes in bipolar disorder, and um, it's highly effective for the treatment of epilepsy. However, we know the uh, potential teratogenicity of Valpro-8, therefore the question uh, using uh, women of childbearing potential used during pregnancy uh, for a product which um, in a niche population is the only therapeutic opportunity. So a uh, benefit-risk approach was applied and uh, a set of measures were put in place for uh, Valpro-8 safe and effective use uh, without forgetting uh, the potential for uh, <laughs> side effect, minor, major congenital malfor uh, malformation, autism spectrum disorder. So a set of uh, risk minimization measures were applied, routine and additional, and obviously a study uh, to assess their effectiveness, actually uh, more than one. Uh, some conducted in a sample of uh, EU countries, selected countries, and some also performed uh, um, at the national level in addition to that. So I would say we would have to look product by product, depending on the indication, depending on all the available therapeutic options and, uh, and apply uh, and see uh, what we have uh, also on the market, which are our options, whether the patient could also be switched to another treatment. Um, if the patient is willing, for example, to continue uh, the treatment once, um, has become pregnant, there are so many elements to take into account. This could probably take uh, take hours. So I would stop here um, in the interest of time. Yeah, uh, thanks, Maria Giovanna. Uh, the, the question was as well uh, uh, from the colleagues uh, that they find effects on fertility a bit unspecific and um, it is unclear uh, when uh, we should put use in pregnancy as, as missing information. And I think to, to really answer this question, we would need to go uh, uh, to example by example, uh, uh, case by case uh, uh, scenario to, to disentangle it. It really, it really not, it is not a, a straightforward, um, straightforward uh, uh, answer to this. For instance, I don't know, uh, yuck inhibitors um, and some other products which uh, effects on on um, the the fetus that are known uh, or some other teratogens uh, is that really missing information? In that case, it's more like identified or or potential. And for use in pregnancy, uh, then we mostly rely. On, I'm sorry, there is some um, submarine ping coming through from somewhere. Um, the uh, for use in pregnancy. 
Uh, yeah, it depends on so many factors, just as, as uh, Agnes mentioned from uh, the fact that uh, the um, uh, women are, are more likely to, to become pregnant even later and even under uh, while taking certain um, treatments. And uh, in that case, we cannot disregard by um, on, on the, discriminate based on the age, for instance, or simply on the indication, because it might happen that uh, these uh, women uh, become pregnant. So uh, it's a difficult one to, to, to answer. And hopefully the uh, coming uh, GVP on pregnancy uh, should clarify some of these, uh, some of these um, questions a little bit more. Just to add, Marine, if I may, I hope you can hear me well. That also Marine, we... Marine. Yes? Go ah, ahead, please. <laughs> no, just to complement uh, what uh, Marine was saying, that also we have uh, the cases where, for example, for a multiple sclerosis product, we had in the beginning animal studies already showing some reproductive toxicity and uh, effects on the fetus. But we so we started by putting already an important identified risk, taking some measures, setting up a registry, information in the SNPC, also educational materials. And then as time progresses and we start having more use of the product and data in the PSURs and, and other um, procedures to assess, we ended up having uh, the conclusion and actually contraindicating the product. So it's also the fact that at the beginning, we don't know everything of what will happen with the product. As you know, pregnant and breastfeeding women are one of the special populations that we don't have a lot of data at the time of the marketing authorization. So it can also be the case that you start by giving the product already with some measures, but you end up restricting even more. And this was our case. Um, this case particularly, that you then, as time progresses, as time goes by, you ended up contraindicating, having the need for a negative pregnancy test before you start uh, the, 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 pro the product, taking the treatment. Uh, you needed effective contraception to be ensured before treatment, during treatment, and after treatment discontinuation, and uh, having uh, details that you would stop treatment if, if you would become pregnant, and it would be very uh, important for uh, patients to have counseling and and then treatment is continued. So it's uh, exactly as Marin was saying, also something that evolves with time. You might start with the uh, missing information and then end up having a contraindication or already an important risk. Um, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Maria. Um, do, do we have uh, any, any more questions or comments uh, from colleagues? If uh, if no immediate questions, maybe we can go to Slido. We have a, a few questions on Slido that require minimum exposure and maximum outcome. So, <laughs> so colleagues, it's very important that you uh, use the uh, QR code if you can, or join at going to on your computer to slido.com and using that a password i mean the password the pass number and uh, you will see the question and you can answer and by ticking the, the boxes and we can see how you you uh, approach some of the question we we've asked so please um we give you a little bit of time for the first one to uh, be able to show to be make sure that you have been able to join uh, but uh, please uh, start answering if you can. Thank you. Uh, we see some answers. That's good. Please continue, continue answering. Uh, Agnes, can, can we, do we know how many responses we, we get so that... Ah, I see them up in the in the corner. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, you have to wait a little bit. Uh, you know, they're starting to to come in. Uh, the first one is always the longest because people get into the system and uh, have to read the questions also to try to decide which options and may change their views. So yeah, you yeah. see others are coming. So give give us a a minute or so, and then the other will be a little faster. Yeah, no problem. I mean, uh, we have plenty of time anyway. So uh, yeah. 
seem to have said that the, my last thing is on uh, muted. So I was saying that it's a sort of similar uh, topic as we just uh, discussed, but uh, it's uh, it's an important question, in fact, because we regulators haven't done a, a good job on this one. And uh, at the same time, you know, as I said, we are we are focusing on on fears and, and safety issues and we forget the benefits. So the balance is very difficult to, to bear because, of course, you don't want to repeat what has happened with Valproate while not a, a dismissing the benefits of Valproate in some situations. But the issue is when, a, for example, a woman, a woman with epilepsy becomes pregnant, how do you manage that? Because we know that when they are well controlled with a treatment by a for epilepsy, you don't want to change the treatment, and at the same time, you don't want them to. You want them to be able to to become pregnant if they want so, and you want them to be able to have a safe pregnancy uh, and while keeping the, the epilepsy in check, because that's also not good for the pregnancy. Yeah. Okay, so maybe we can consider that we have a a number of answers. You see the numbers. Thirty-five. Yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I think we have 140 or so participants. Uh, I, I, as, as far as I understand, uh, many colleagues are dialing in from a joint connection, so there's more than than um, than one person behind the connection. Indeed, uh, indeed, so, yes. So yeah, yeah, maybe there's more than just 36 um, colleagues uh, responding. So um, as I said. Uh, it, Sometimes there is no one. There is no one answer, and in one instance, the track would decide on one side. In the other instance, it would decide uh, on another. In this very uh, example that I took from the track, but I, I couldn't disclose the, the the product and so on. Uh, the answer is B. All right. The the track decided to go with uh, uh, listing uh, listing uh, in 4.6 of the S and PC and uh, putting it as a safety concern. Uh, in the in the RMP uh, option D, of course, is is uh, is not an option uh, really. If the drug uh, uh, shows to to prove uh, shows some uh, effect or sufficient uh, magnitude of effect in the indication and the benefit risk is positive, uh, this would not tilt the the, the benefit risk uh, to to the negative. So D uh, is is not really uh, an option. We we normally approve products uh, like this. Uh, not so, meaning we do not not approve them because of the questions of impaired fertility and fetal toxicity, right? So D is off the table. Um, just listing something uh, as as an important potential risk, but not listing it in the SNPC uh, on the basis of there is no data. I can understand the, the logic behind it. We have no data, so we're not sure. So it won't go in the SNPC, but Let's put it in the RMP to be on the safe side. Is not really an option either. Uh, we don't we we don't really do things this way so that we are assured we're not doing anything. The the point is that there has to be some action behind it, right? Um, and then uh, option A, meaning um, listing it in the SNPC but not included as a safety concern, uh, I think would get some sympathies at the track. Uh, as well. It's not that it hasn't happened. In this instance, uh, it went uh, for both SNPC and the and the safety concern in the RMP, but I could imagine uh, A being an option as well, which I think uh, reflects uh, the, the opinions of, of colleagues on the line as well with a quarter of, of the participants uh, or those who responded anyway, um, uh, going for, for option A. So that was one example. We can move to the next one, I think. So we want to see more respondents next time. We had 40 this time. Yeah, it's a challenge for you, you all to respond more to our questions. Thank you. Can we see the next question, please? Yeah. Uh, I was limited with the number of characters, so I had to abbreviate some words. I hope you don't mind. Uh, and uh, I couldn't provide as much data as you would need to answer some of the questions. So. Yeah, we have to work with uh, with what we have. So RMM are risk ma uh, minimization measures, of course.
And this is like uh, like Eurovision, you know, the, the leader is changing all the time. It's <laughs> At 14, colleague 16, a little effort. More votes, please. The question is, do we do, we just describe it, or do we do something about by adding risk minimizations, and do we do a specific study in a, in a practice, or a combination yeah. of options? Yeah, exactly. So the question is really, do nothing, do something, or try to do something plus further characterize it. Um, uh, this, is, this is a very typical example, so uh, it, it pops up all the time in, in the assessments. We will do better than 40. We are at 40. A little effort for some people who have not answered last time. Forty-one. All right, let's let's uh, let's break it down. Uh, the, the answer for this one was A, believe it or not. Um, Infusion-related reactions with monoclonal antibodies um, is, is such, a, such a common thing uh, since the advent of monoclonal antibodies that um, the rationale for uh, just uh, having routine risk minimization for um, uh, infusion-related reactions uh, has become the, the common clinical practice and knowledge of, of the physicians about them. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, for for monoclonals, especially chimeric and so on, the um, inf infusion related reactions were, were something to 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 deal with and to um, you know deal with special attention and so on. But now it is considered that that it's become kind of a common knowledge that they induce that. There's usually warnings in the S and I mean there's always warnings in the S and PC on on these uh, these reactions. And in some cases, there's additional risk minimization measures, but time progresses, uh, there's uh, fewer and fewer additional risk minimization measures to, 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 to um, handle uh, infusion-related uh, uh, reactions. We need to consider that, uh, although the, 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 the catch here is that 70% of the patients experience infusion-related reactions, yes, so that kind of um, that, that that's that's the red light, right? But uh, of those seventy percent, ten percent are grade three and higher, and some grade three uh, are, uh, as you know, they don't have to um, endanger the patient really to that extent. And uh, in many cases, the practice decides not to go for additional risk minimization measures for IRRs. So uh, here on in this example, the answer was. Hey, uh, in, if Marine, we tweak these yeah, yeah, Marine, would you say that it would be better to use the resources to monitor other things or to work from the pharmacovigilance perspective on other things than this one that are well known and do not require, I mean, that, that is not a surprise or anything that we cannot manage, hopefully. Yeah. And also, of course, looking yeah, at the time, yeah. Marine, we need to move on because we need to, to continue. Uh, we only have 10 minutes left. Over. Yeah, there's there are two more on it. Uh, can we move to the next one, please? Uh, all right. So this is a, not a biological, but but a chemical. Uh, it undergoes first pass metabolism of thirty percent. So there's uh, quite a large uh, portion of active substance remaining in the system. It has a wide therapeutic window, non oncology indication, but an orphan indication. Okay. The impact of hepatic impairment was deemed unaccessible because there was too few subjects uh, in the trial. And the applicant had a PK study that they were just about to start. 
to assess uh, those response. I mentioned this in my presentation earlier, so that's why I'm coming back. So the those response meaning efficacy. So do we use this study, which is aimed for efficacy for pharmacovigilance purposes, uh, to clarify, to shed more light on hepatically impaired patients using this product? So the option A is hepatic impairment or using hepatically impaired patients should be missing info in the RMP and a dedicated pharmacovigilance study should be requested. B, this should not be missing information or a safety concern as it's not likely to be an issue. There's a wide therapeutic window and the not too extensive metabolism. Or C, uh, C um, uh, it should be missing information and safety data from the PK study should be used to characterize it. If you remember, I mentioned piggy piggybacking on some um, phase one, two studies, so that's that's a hint. Yeah, I think I think we have already uh, an indication where we're going with this. So yes, the the answer is is C. Normally, as I said, PK studies are not, and but if we can get useful information to to shed more light, patient populations, the in plan, uh, and so we tackle the missing information, which in this case is use in. Um, hepatically impaired patients. So uh, the PRAC went for option C as 80% of the respondents replied. Um, we can go to the last example. We have five more minutes and then this, this one. All right, another chemical, small molecule, tyrosine kinase inhibitor uh, for oncology. Clinical data on hepatotoxicity shows roughly 30% of the subjects experience hepatotoxicity 12% of the patients, in 12% of the patients, it leads to treatment interruption. In 5% of the patients, it leads to treatment discontinuation. So, so that's of the full exposed number. Uh, grade three of, of those who, who experience it is 15%. Grade four is one and a half percent. There were no fatal cases in the, in the program. So uh, hepatotoxicity, as per the, what's presented, requires Warning in 4.4 and addition in 4.8. PI changes as per A plus educational materials and uh, all of the above plus a post authorization safety study because hepatotoxicity is so super important for this product. Or D, uh, changes to the PI and um, kind of uh, enhanced follow-up in the PSURs plus routine monitoring. Really well done. Yeah, the, the answer is D. The, uh, this would normally go for, um, uh, I mean, additions to the PI, obviously some warnings, but would not require additional uh, risk minimization measures. If you tweak the numbers to the left or right, it might change the, the assessment and uh, go, but in this case, this was decided. So D, PI and routine pharmacovigilance plus PSRs. That covers it from my end. Thank you any very class? much. Yeah, any, thank any, you any very much, Marine. We'll take last questions because we have still two two minutes. Last question or clarification from the the anybody in the audience? Just take the floor, please. Yeah. 
If there are no comments, please let me thank very much Marine and your colleagues. Um, so Maya and Maya, uh, sorry, I forgot the second second name. Maya, um, a, the two Mayas, let's say. Thank you very much for, for participating and, and contributing to the discussion. Thank you to the audience for the um, the uh, responding to the Slido, for asking questions. This is what we want in this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. We are breaking for half an hour and we go back for G uh, GMP uh, in half an hour. And uh, so for those of you who are staying online, uh, please uh, come back in half an hour. Um, I think Ricardo wants to say a word. Ricardo, please. No, just um, as um, Maria Giovanna and Maria, who are uh, also connected today, um, they have already prepared <laughs> some uh, some material, some case studies. If you're interested to see them, it would be nice if uh, when you receive the feedback form, you indicate it. Uh, so if you're interested, I think that they're very, very, very interesting. So please indicate that uh, your interest for it. And uh, the other thing maybe I would like to, to ask is that uh, when you receive this feedback form, if there is anything that we haven't covered uh, in this year, uh, in, in all the trainings we've done so far, and uh, you would like to, to see covered, please indicate in the, in the feedback form and we will do our best to to cover uh, what you want to 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 to, to uh, in the next uh, trainings, uh, uh, probably we will do another one by the end of the year or uh, or uh, next year. Thank you, thank you very much, Marin, and uh, to all the audience, and uh, also from my from my side, and to the panelists, Maria and Maria Giovanna. Thanks. Sorry, Maya Giovanna, suddenly your, your second first name escaped me. Uh, thank you very much for your participation all. And a, as Ricardo said, we count on you filling in the form of evaluations. Very important to improve based on your assessment. So please let us know what you think, what we can improve. The, the training is, uh, thank you for the, the votes of strength that we see in the, uh, with the, <laughs> the clapping hands. Um, Marine, this is, uh, and uh, Maya and Maya Giovanna, this is for you. Um, and also Viola, who is in the, the has also helped us uh, preparing this session. Um, I think we want to have other topics, you know, that we now doing uh, training which is more advanced, but more into detail. So think about the topics that are essential to you, and we will try to address them in the next session. So thank you very much. So uh, you. for most of you, uh, see you in a half an hour. Marine, thank you very much. Thanks. Goodbye. Okay, dear colleagues, uh, maybe it's time to come back and uh, switch on your computer for the next webinar on GMP inspection. And uh, we're very pleased to have with us today Antonio Azevedo, who is going to present a GMP inspection from the uh, practical aspect and the aspect of a, uh, a how you do it and what are the very important points. So again, prepare your question, be ready to uh, ask for clarification. And uh, we're very happy to have you back uh, now. Antonio, I will give you the floor. Just want to remind everybody, please make sure, actively sure that you're muted so we don't have background noise. Thank you very much and don't hesitate to intervene. Thank you. Thank you very much, Agnes. Um, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to be here today um, performing this presentation on carrying out the GMP um, inspection. The plan today is to, to have a very brief introduction, um, then talk about how to select GMP sites to be inspected. The inspection itself, the preparation, the inspection, the follow-up, the cases where there are non-compliances with GMP detected and the associated regulator's dilemma, some brief considerations on distant assessments, and also a very brief conclusion. I, I will stop after each topic, um, and please, like Agnes mentioned, any question you might have, do not uh, hesitate.
So just remind that an inspection is an on-site assessment of the compliance with the community GMP principles and is performed by uh, officials of EU national competent authorities. Any manufacturer of medicines for the EU market, no matter where they are located in the globe, must comply with um, EU GMP uh, to assure that the consistency of, of the medicine's quality, that the medicines are appropriate for the use they are intended to, and to meet the requirements of the marketing authorization or of the clinical trial authorization. Considering the increasing complexity of global supply chains and the, the high number of manufacturing sites that need to be supervised within a frequency that should not exceed three years, it was necessary for um, EU national competent authorities to develop a systematic and risk-based approach um, for inspection planning. This uh, approach needs to be focused always on the risk for public health. Taking that into account, a community procedure was developed, um, part of the compilation of community procedures on inspections and exchange of information, uh, which is a public document. Um, a model was uh, was developed for, for this risk-based planning of inspections. Um, and one of the outputs, it's the annual inspection uh, routine uh, program um, in order to, to maximize the available resources, sometimes can be very scarce and always to prioritize the highest risk sites taking into account the risk to product quality and the risk to um, public health. This, this tool will also allow to define the frequency, the depth and the breadth of the inspections, um, allowing the inspectorates to be more flexible and have a more effective supervision at the same time maintaining the highest possible level of patient safety. So this quality risk management tool um, will rank manufacturing sites, each manufacturing site, uh, taking into account uh, risk criteria. So there are two main risk criteria that are considered, um, the intrinsic risk and the compliance risk. So for each individual manufacturing site, a score will be um, given. Um, in terms of intrinsic risk, it's uh, important to consider the complexity of the site, um, the processes and products, and the criticality of the products or service um, provided by that site. So in terms of, of complexity, um, the size of the site is one of the aspects that should be considered. Obviously, sites with higher, um, that are bigger, will have more um, associated risk um, from the layouts to all the, the mix-up uh, um, potential. Um, the number of, of manufacturing processes, uh, as it increases, will also increase uh, the risk of a site. In terms of uh, dedication of equipment and facilities, for example, AHUs, um, any part of equipment, any equipment, any room or any area, obviously a site where there is no uh, dedication approach or no, no dedication um, whatsoever will have an higher risk than a site where um, some mitigation actions are implemented. The number of staff or also uh, the number of market supply, as you understand, um, if a given site supplies uh, multiple EU markets, uh, it will be more critical than one site that supplies only uh, a couple of, of EU markets. The extensive use of, of contract manufacturers or um, contract laboratories will increase also the, the risk of the operations, sterile processes, septic uh, um, processing processes also will increase the risk and other, other factors. Um, the criticality of, of the products or services in the scope of the intrinsic risk, um, it's also something that should be considered. Um, if a site is, is uh, one of the major or, or even in worst case, the sole supplier of an essential product, um, the risk has to be higher and it has to be supervised uh, at a more frequent, um, more, more frequently than, than other sites. Uh, the same happening for sites that have uh, specific test methods, for example, specific specific equipments that require um, a lot of expertise and uh, on which multiple other manufacturers will, will subcontract. These sites uh, will deserve more attention um, in terms of routine planning. 
on the other hand, uh, the compliance risk um, is the risk that is based on and calculated based on uh, the outcome of the last inspection. So in terms of GMP compliance verified in the last inspection, um, the number of critical major and other findings are, are pondered a risk rating assigned. So if a site has, has had in the last inspection any critical finding, or if a site has had in the last inspection more than six major findings, the risk score will be higher um, and it will be uh, reflected in the increased frequency of inspections. And it's also important to consider that um, while the intrinsic risk remains more or less constant um, for the site, uh, the compliance risk will vary a lot and give us um, an idea of uh, the more uh, current state of, of GMP compliance of, of that site. On the other hand, this tool, um, the quality risk management tool that uh, is used in, in the EU, also uh, provides for the entry by the inspectors following the inspection um, of additional information. So areas where uh, findings were detected and that will deserve more uh, attention uh, during the next inspection. Um, areas that were not inspected and will have to be inspected in the next inspection. Um, any special expertise these inspectors feel will be required for the next inspection. So the tool will also allow for this continuum on, on information from one inspection to, um, to the next. As the output of uh, the, this QRM tool uh, sites um, will be uh, determined a risk. So if a site is a, a low risk site, the inspection frequency might be uh, reduced. Um, for example, uh, one inspection every two and a half years or every three years uh, max. Um, if the site determined uh, is medium, these uh, manufacturing sites will be inspected at a more intermediate frequency, for example, between one and two uh, years. Um, if, on the other hand, a high risk has been determined based on the uh, risk factors we, we talked about, um, these sites will be inspected at uh, an increased frequency, so at least annually and sometimes even more um, frequently. It's also important to bear in mind that the system is not uh, static, so a number of factors will contribute and can trigger a review of the risk um, classification of a given site and have an impact on the frequency of the next inspection. So obviously the, the, the historic compliance knowledge by the agency of a given site is very important to know how they are behaving uh, GMP-wise through the years. Um, the results of, of sampling and program testing um, performed by OMCLs or other national OMCL testing programs will also uh, be considered if uh, OOSs are detected, for example, that will be considering the risk and the, the frequency might be uh, decreased for the next routine inspection. The same happening um, regarding quality defects and recalls. If a high number of quality defects is detected for a specific type of product, specific type of process, that will also be encompassed in the risk rating. Um, variations to, to the marketing authorizations, so changes, for example, in primary packaging or other changes that might trigger um, introduction of new equipment, of new uh, processes, of new expertise on site will um, trigger also the review of the risk rating. Information from trusted authorities outside the EU is very important. Um, major changes that the, the, the authority is aware in terms of building, equipment, processes and uh, personnel, all of these changes can have um, impact on, on the GMP compliance of the site and will be incorporated uh, in, in the risk rating and also um, if there are changes in frequency, volume, or number of batches manufactured of a given product uh, that the authority feels, the, the inspectorate feels, that can have um, deteriorous impact on, on GMP compliance of the site. Regarding API sites, it's important uh, that um, for this uh, uh, site, they are subject to, to regular supervision. Um, 
in the EU and in third countries they will be inspected when there are grounds for uh, suspecting uh, non-compliance. Again, for example, um, through the results of sampling performed of, of a starting material coming from those API sites, from quality defects uh, where the root cause is assigned to uh, the API, um, when there are doubts regarding the authenticity of data um, in case of biological APIs and so on. Again, the compilation of community procedures as a specific um, guidance on, on the occasions where it is appropriate to perform inspection at um, API manufacturers and uh, also excipient uh, manufacturers based on, on, on a risk-based um, approach. Here we remember that uh, the legal obligation to um, assure that APIs are manufactured according to uh, GMP uh, chapter, uh, chapter, uh, part two and um, GDP relies with the, um, the, the finished product manufacturer and the number of, of uh, evidences that have to be produced, namely the QP declaration, and that will be based on the, the frequent audits of, of these API manufacturers that will also be reviewed during the inspection. In terms of planning, it's also important to, to bear in mind always that for each individual inspection, um, the inspector team should be um, chosen based on the appropriate qualifications and training. Again, we have a guideline on the training and qualification requisites of GMP inspectors, which is very important. And uh, when planning um, each inspection, uh, the team should be balanced in order to have the appropriate skills needed uh, for that specific manufacturer, for that specific product or process. I would stop here um, and ask you if you have any question in relation to um, the, the inspection planning and, and the approach that is in place in the EU. Um, if no one has questions, I, I have a, a simple, I, I think, question. But uh, um, in the risk um, risk based approach you showed, um, you say that uh, three years is the maximum uh, period between inspections. Uh, is there are there any cases where, uh, let's say, on a risk based uh, uh, based on risk based considerations, this uh, three years uh, frequency can be exceeded? Thank you, Ricardo, for the uh, great question. Uh, yeah, occasions are, are predicted where um, the frequency of inspection of a given activity might be increased um, to, to five years, uh, always uh, risk-based, but we should all try to to uh, have um, within the three years uh, an inspection even if it does not cover that specific activity um, also in order to keep um, the manufacturer aware uh, of, of evolving requisites of evolving regulatory framework and to keep the authority also aware of what is going on uh, at that specific manufacturer but like you say there are cases where this could be um, based on risk increased to, to five years, based on, on the associated risk to those specific activities um, that, that will be um, pondered also in this exercise. And uh, remembering we also have to prioritize always the sites with highest risk and uh, um, manage the resources accordingly, which can be uh, quite challenging. Thanks. Um Another thing is um, this compilation of community procedures that you mentioned. I, I know because of my experience how an important document it is, but uh, I find uh, that it's not uh, that uh, well known as uh, it should be. Can you can you just uh, tell the audience what uh, what it is and uh, a little bit more details on on it? The compilation. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you, um, Ricardo. Well, the, the compilation, it's one of the most important tools uh, that uh, we have at EU level in order to facilitate cooperation and increase harmonization between um, inspectorates of, of, uh, of member states. Um, it's also a requisite that 
inspectorates have themselves uh, a quality system that will be assessed through a number of tools, uh, a number of programs like a GMP. GAP uh, program or BEMA uh, program, um, and the compilation will uh, provide the, the procedure that will be the basis for those uh, quality systems of national um, inspectorates. Uh, it's it's a, a flowing document also reviewed as as um, knowledge evolves, uh, as harmonization evolves, and um, is is uh, under constant constant development and it's agreed um, by the member states by representatives uh, under uh, the coordination of um, the EMA the EMA has a uh, fundamental coordinating um, role so they they will be agreed by all member states um, normally in the scope of the inspectors working group and adopted by uh, the commission um, and published by by the EMA on on behalf of um, the the Commission. So um, this is is um, the the document that will guide and harmonise the inspection um, activities in 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 Europe. Thank you. So I will move on with the presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, any uh, question you might have uh, in the end, we can also um, we can also get back to to whatever topic desire. So um, following the, the planning of the inspection, it's uh, essential to, to prepare for, for the inspection. And for the preparation, the, the, the inspector team uh, should gather uh, and request all relevant data uh, that is needed to familiarize itself with that uh, manufacturer. Um, in this case, the site master file is a fundamental uh, document to provide an idea to inspectors of um, the approach uh, uh, on quality of the company, the quality system that is in place, the activities that are being performed. Um, so it's a very useful document to to have um, to know in advance more or less what is happening in in the company. The list of products manufactured imported it's also a fundamental tool for for inspectors because will allow them not only to have a, a more a bird's eye view of uh, the products that are manufactured but also will allow them to know. Uh, if any new products have been introduced since last inspection, for example. Uh, and this information can be very useful, um, for example, in the scope of uh, process validation, um, in the scope of, of change control, for example, to see this is a new product, um, how was it introduced in the site, what was considered when it was um, introduced in the site, was product process validation perform? Was there any impact on um, on cleaning validation, on the worst case matrix, for example? Was training provided? So uh, this list of new products um, can be very important. Also important will be for the inspector team to review the last inspection report to know what was detected then um, and the CAPA plan uh, and any pending actions that might still be, be open. Analyze the, the manufacturing authorization, any including any variations that might have happened uh, in the manufacturing authorization since last inspection. Assess also uh, the number and type of product recalls and quality defects that uh, products associated with that manufacturing site had. Again, the, the, the results of sampling um, by, by and testing by OMCLs, um, marketing um, variations that might uh, have happened, uh, and any changes to equipment, um, to processes, and to key personnel. Again, very important in the scope uh, to, to sell. As you know, the inspection process is, is based on, on sampling, so we, uh, in, the inspectors will see only uh, samples of, of the activity. It's impossible within the defined timelines to see everything that is happening but for example changes to equipment might be very useful um, to assess uh, how was this equipment qualified um, did the different stages of qualification been performed it could be a useful example to to check during the inspection um, again changes in key personnel um, how was this reflected is there job descriptions in place how was the initial training performed to this new um, key personnel um, and so on 
And also it's important to gather uh, the information that is available on regulatory databases. So on either GMDP, uh, FDA warning letters or other information from, from uh, other authorities. Another thing that the inspection team should take into account is that um, sometimes, a lot of times it's uh, needed and it's uh, useful to uh, contact experts uh, within the authority to clarify some points um, and to, to have the, the needed feedback on, on some um, process or some system that might be in place that requires uh, more uh, expertise. Uh, it's also predicted um, in Europe that experts can sometimes accompany the inspectors on site and, and provide the, the, assistant, uh, the assistance needed. The use of aid memoirs is also something that could be very useful. Normally, inspectorates will have their own aid memoirs, um, and it's also useful for specific inspections for specific products um, to use to, to draft aid memoirs. This to make sure that uh, no uh, important aspects of GMP are missed during the, the inspection. Then after gathering all this information uh, and uh, analyzing it, it's important to prepare an inspection plan. So it should describe clearly the objectives, the objectives and the scope of the inspection, identify uh, inspection team members and their roles, who is the lead inspector, who is the supporting inspector, if there might be some observators, the, the, the date and location, uh, the organizational units to be inspect, inspected, the time of each um, inspection activity. Um, it's very important also to define the time and communicate clearly to the inspectee the timing, because as you know, probably better than me, um, some inspectees will try to um, waste the most time they can. And this is a way to um, set the timing correctly. And uh, we'll have to see this item on this um, time schedule and uh, um, it will be like that. Um, indicate also in the inspection plan any samples to be taken, um, the time of the final meeting and uh, the schedule what is predicted the timelines for transmission of the inspection report. Within the inspection team, it's important as you prepare the plan also to uh, define and assign the different topics to be inspected by each inspector in order to maximize time and um, all of the inspectors be aware of what they should do within uh, the inspector, inspector team. Then um, the announcement of the inspection. Um, it's important to announce the inspection to make sure that the relevant personnel and documents are in fact in place um, when the inspection occurs. Nevertheless, there are some times where um, it, to not to compromise um, that the objectives of the inspection, inspections will be uh, unannounced. Uh, it is recognized this will be uh, an exceptional, um, not by norm, uh, but sometimes they do have to be unannounced. Um, also something that has to be considered by the inspection team, it's the logistical arrangements. So, um, the need for translators, for example, um, accommodation, transport, and, and so on. I will stop again here. I um, don't know if you have any, any query regarding the inspection preparation um, that, that uh, we might answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I'll move on. And then again, in the end, if, if you want, I'm at uh, your disposal. So the inspection itself, um, always keep in mind that the role of the inspector is to protect uh, public health and the goal will have to be uh, to assess compliance with uh, GMP principles. Um, and we, inspectors have that function to, to ensure that manufacturers adhere to um, EU GMP uh, principles and, and guidelines. Normally, the inspection will start with the opening meeting. It's important that management and key personnel are also present. Um, the inspection team will present um, themselves and introduce, again, uh, review, uh, outline the purpose um, and the scope of that inspection. We'll review the organizational chart in place to look for um, preliminary gaps that might have that might exist, and uh, again, uh, reinforce the documentation that will be needed during the inspection. 
during the opening meeting, it's also important that the company um, describes the quality management system in place, um, that the changes that were um, previously made aware to the inspectors are described and detailed um, regarding facilities, products, personnel, equipment. Provide any update they might have on the previous CAPA, if any actions are still to be implemented. Um, designate the contact points for each topic so that the inspectors know with whom to speak for for each uh, in the scope of each topic and allocate um, premises uh, rooms for the inspectors if uh, that is needed. After the opening meeting, um, sometimes it's useful to start the inspection with um, a rapid plan tour uh, so that the inspectors can familiarize themselves with the site and the changes that occur to the site and try to identify any signals of, of, problem, of problems that might exist on the systems, on the products or on the processes. Um, these plan tours uh, should ideally follow the logical flow of operations, so start in the reception operations of starting materials uh, in the starting materials warehouse, go through the utilities, the production area, uh, through quality control and uh, the, the, the finished product uh, warehouse. Um, it could be useful to have um, during the inspection on a different day or days a detailed plan tour uh, to assess um, in depth the suitability of the design of the layout of the records of the activities um, and sometimes uh, to go immediately to the shop floor after arrival might be of value so um, to see exactly what is going on uh, without um, any uh, time for, for different behavior or, or accommodation of behaviors um, of, of the, the, the personnel. The inspection plan is defined, but we always have to keep in mind that it will be and it might have to be adjusted as necessary as the findings that are being detected, the deficiencies that are being raised, um, the plan might need to be adjusted. Another important point is to always discuss the observations with, with the, the company personnel so they are aware of what's happening and um, there are no misunderstandings on the one hand and on the other hand they can start remedial action as soon as possible. Another um, important uh, aspect of the inspection process will be the review of documentation, review all, all the SOPs, all the records uh, within the quality management system that might be relevant to assess uh, uh, GMP uh, compliance. I have put here a number of, of documents that are uh, normally reviewed um, in, in a, a routine inspection. They are um, ordered um, based on, on the EU uh, GMP guide uh, chapters. Um, it's not uh, extensive. Um, this again will be adapted to uh, each and single inspection, but it's uh, important to uh, determine what the important documentation will be and that it is in fact reviewed during the inspection. After the inspection here, um, it was very quick, but could be five days, could be four days, three days. Uh, you know um, better than me uh, the, the effort it takes. Um, there's the final meeting. Again, management and key personnel should be present. Um, the inspectors will summarize uh, the findings that were identified. They will be discussed um, into some to, to, to some level, and and deadlines can be agreed for um, the remedial uh, actions. It's important that all these deficiencies are uh, based on facts and objective evidence gathered by the inspectors. And it's important that also um, the company agrees. It might not be the case, but when possible, um, agreement of the company would be um, important. Uh, the company uh, on, its, uh, on its hand could start discussing with the inspectors um, possible corrective and preventive actions, possible uh, remedial actions. Um, and uh, again, it's important to underline that these uh, should be um, started at uh, the earliest possible uh, date. In cases there are serious deficiencies that can pose serious risk to product quality and um, public and animal health, it's important that the inspector takes immediate action. Remind also that um, 
it's important that inspectors create a positive atmosphere during the inspection. We know it's a stressful occasion for all parts involved, so positive atmosphere, it's uh, very important. Um, the inspector should answer the questions, but uh, avoid entering the role of um, a consultant and also include educational and motivating elements. So not only um, evidence what is wrong, it's important, but also evidence things that the company might be doing uh, in a good level of GMP compliance. Um, it's important that inspectors also try to have the minimal possible impact on the normal uh, activities of the company and um, confidential information that will be consulted will has to be handled with, with great integrity and, and great care. The fundamental aspect during the inspection process, it's the judgment by uh, the inspectors on site, uh, assessing the degree of compliance. So it's important to have uh, um, a big picture and have uh, the, the whole quality system in mind and to end and all um, the measures implemented uh, in order to adequately judge a given finding um, within, within all the available information. I will stop here again, um, looking for any questions you might have on uh, uh, regarding the inspection performance. So colleagues, questions, clarifications uh, to Antonio? No? You can take the floor if you want, just uh, don't be shy. <laughs> But we can also yeah, we, can, we can also move on, Agnes, if you agree, and then yes, please, um, yes, please go on, go on. I'm sure colleagues will have questions. So the, the inspection has been performed and now we are following up on it. Uh, we, uh, you, the inspectors. Um, so um, normally there's a, a preliminary report that is um, issued. Um, including the, the findings. The company will reply with, with the CAPA plan. Uh, it is the expectation of inspectors that it's an adequate CAPA plan that clearly identifies the, the root cause of the deficiency and has appropriate action to um, mitigate uh, any impact and prevent recurrence. Um, and the, the, the fundamental point in the CAPA plan would be that the company evidences knowledge of, of the process and of, of the product. Following the reception and assessment of the CAPA plan, the inspector's team might have need for to request additional clarifications, and then uh, the final inspection report will be issued. So this report will have to abide to the community format, also included in the compilation of community procedures. We'll have to include a clear statement on whether um, the manufacturer complies with GMP, um, EU GMP or not. Um, and also should include uh, a short description of, of uh, the company and the activities that the company performs. Um, this uh, short description of, of the inspection itself and, and all the, like we, we said, all, all the findings, observations and um, deficiencies. As you know, findings will be graded as critical and major um, and, and other findings uh, based on the impact and the risk to uh, product quality and public or animal health. I put them here and leave them here, the definitions for your um, awareness. Uh, and um, as any inspection will have uh, as an outcome, um, not any, any, but almost any inspection will have as an outcome. Um, within 90 days, it, it has to have an outcome of whether it is compliant or non-compliant with GMP. So within 90 days, either a GMP certificate is issued in either GMTP uh, in the European database or a, a statement of non-compliance with GMP is issued on EUDRA um, GMDP. After um, the, the certificate is issued, it's important that um, the inspectorate follows up with the company on the implementation of the CAPA plan. As you know, there might be some actions in the CAPA plan that do to um, the impact they have and the changes needed might uh, need more than 90 days. And it's important that the, the authority follows up to see if this CAPA, uh, the timelines are being abided. and um, take action if not, if uh, it was predicted to be closed on this date and it is not, 
the authority has to ponder action, perhaps a reinspection or follow-up inspection. Um, and another important point in the EU system is the, that the outcome of each um, GMP inspection is recognized uh, by all member states as the inspections are carried out on behalf of the European Union. So sometimes um, there are non-compliance with, with GMP. Um, like we said, in this case, it's important the inspection team makes their concerns clear to the inspected site. Be aware also that the report might not be finalized in time in order to implement the appropriate measures to protect public or animal health. And the inspectors will also have to perform a supervisory risk um, assessment to evaluate the critical and the major deficiencies, the overall risk to quality um, and to supply of the product and recommend the needed mitigating actions. So this could be the recall of the product batches that are already Already released onto the market. Mm -hmm. This could be um, the prohibitions um, of, of importation or, or supply um, and could include also administrative um, action uh, in the manufacturing authorizations or in the, uh, the marketing authorizations or in the uh, CEPs. We also need to consider that GMP compliance um, may lead to product uh, shortages and that brings us to um, a frequent regulators dilemma. So um, to have substandard products on the market or to have a shortage, uh, for example, in the case of a GMP non-compliance statement for a manufacturer, which is the only approved manufacturer of an essential product. So bear in mind that there might be instances where the product withdrawn or, or not releasing the product might do more harm to patients than allowing the product to remain on the market under um, certain conditions, for example, um, increased testing uh, or increased stability requirements and, and so on. So it was um, a mechanism was developed in the EU uh, to have a coordinated approach. Um, this mechanism and procedures have been also published in the compilation of um, union procedures in order to have uh, a coordinated and then harmonized assessment and the proportionate, proportionate actions uh, to, to balance on one hand, the protection of patients, patients and also to minimize um, the, the supply disruptions at the same time, ensuring the maximum um, efficiency um, and avoiding duplicate of uh, reviews at national level. Two um, important criteria were developed to uh, classify the products that are um, in fact needed and critical, so the therapeutic use of a product and uh, the availability of um, alternatives. Finally, just some considerations on distant assessments. Distance assessments will be assessment of the compliance of a site with um, EU a GMP performed by, by inspectors based on documents and interviews supported by technology for communicating, accessing systems, sharing and reviewing documents and other informations without the inspectors being physically present at the sites where these activities occur. So it can be a very important tool to determine uh, compliance status of manufacturing sites um, in the scope of national or international crisis like the one we are currently um, dealing regarding COVID um, pandemic. So um, in this instance and other instances, uh, on-site inspections might not be possible due to travel restrictions or risk to health um, of inspectors, risk to security of inspectors um, and distant assessments might be a very useful tool uh, in these cases. Also important to um, bear in mind that uh, a case-by-case -case assessment will have to be performed um, regarding the feasibility of a distant assessment. So it will also depend on the criticality of the manufacturing activities 
and of the products concerned um, and also of the knowledge that uh, you might have of that site. There might be some uh, processes or some products that due to their complexity, um, the inspectorate might judge that a distant assessment will not be an adequate um, tool to, to check compliance and a non-site inspection uh, should be performed. Um, nevertheless, even when a decent assessment is uh, deemed feasible, uh, on-site inspection should be performed whenever circumstances um, allow. Um, in the scope of distant assessments, always consider um, also uh, if the necessary resources and IT capabilities are in place. So a number of prerequisites are, are needed to perform a distant assessment. So, uh, for example, to have appropriate platforms to share um, data, to have teleconference or video conference systems to support um, real time discussions to have uh, live uh, um, camera footage or, or video recordings of the site, if it is possible for the inspectors to have live access to the computerized system um, that are GMP related on site, or if they have, uh, be, if they can be granted remote access to read-only access to those system. Um, we also need to consider the time zone of the inspectors and of uh, the, the, the manufacturing site if it, if it, if if they are very different time zones, um, the feasibility has to be assessed. And um, again, questions like the need for, for translators, how you get certified translators according to your um, procedure. So in conclusion, um, we, we should always remember that any manufacturer, whatever, the, whenever, whatever, no matter where it is located, must comply with, with GMP to supply products to the EU. And that the EU system for supervision of, of, of manufacturer, manufacturers is based on two main pillars, the authorization registration of the operators in the supply chain and the inspections of those um, operators. So in this sense, GMP inspections are fundamental, um, a fundamental cornerstone for the benefit of public and animal health in the European Union. Um, so now I, I open, um, the, the floor for questions. Yeah. We are. We have Thanks. also some slides. You, you have several questions, and a, the first one was regarding uh, when do you consider that an inspection is completed? Is it at the time you have received and accepted the kappa, or is there are different timelines that where you you say is this is done, and after that there will be follow up, but it's completed. Uh, thank you, thank you, Agnes, for, for the question. So. Um, the, the 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 milestone um, that is most important would be the issuance of of the GMP certificate um, or not. Um, nevertheless, like we we we, we speak, um, there might be actions that are still pending in the Kappa. So in order to um, be aware of those actions and, and follow them up, in order to to make sure they are implemented in those timelines. Um, I believe it would be uh, useful to to close the the GMP um, inspection to consider it completed after um, the, the the kappa has been has been um, implemented, or to find uh, a way where the supervision uh, is is um, performed within the quality system. So even if the inspection is uh, completed after uh, um, issuance of the GMP certificate um, and acceptance of, of the kappa mechanisms should be in place to assure that the kappa is followed up by the authority be specific when you say mechanism should be in place for this follow-up which is also relating to the next question so what type of mechanism is in place is it a systematic uh, let's say monthly review uh, six monthly review or is it um, you expect the company to take care of this uh, uh, mechanism? Who, who is taking the lead? And are there gaps in the in our follow-ups? Um, it's a genuine question for my part because I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm saying also uh, in in um, 
a division of the authority, even if the, the inspection um, is, is considered completed, it's important that within the inspectorate there are mechanisms that allow to the follow up of, of the CAPA. In the company, they must have that and that, that must be implemented. Make sure that the actions are not only defined, also implemented in time, and there's a, um, a efficacy assessment after implementation. So it's important that after they are implemented, um, the company assesses, did this uh, mitigate the risk? Did this eliminate the root cause? And if not, to go back and define new, to perform a, a new um, investigation and define new actions to adequately mitigate that. Um, and also the, the, the inspectorate should bear this in mind. So if, if the company says, um, so uh, we need, uh, in, during the inspection, it was determined that uh, due to contamination, cross-contamination, that specific equipment um, will have to be um, dedicated to that product. If you want to continue manufacturing this product in this uh, conditions, you need to have dedicated equipment. So when the company will say, okay, in the CAPA, we will stop uh, using this equipment for this product. You, we will uh, buy a new equipment and the, the, the timeline for implementation will be six months. The authority, the inspectors might accept it um, and the, the process might be closed before six months come by. But it's important that when the six months come by, the company informs that. So we have uh, bought the equipment, we have qualified the equipment, it's under, um, it will be start uh, use. Uh, or on the other hand, inform the inspectors. So. Um, there are problems uh, in the in the, to, to, to buy the equipment. There's a lot of demand at this time. So we will need no, nine months instead of six or one year. And uh, um, there are mechanisms in both sides that allow for the, 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 the verification uh, periodic, like you said, for example, on a monthly basis. So um, is there anything pending still here? And then when all the actions are implemented, we, we can consider it closed. I don't know if, you, if, I, if I answer your, your query. Very well, you know, very well. There is both a responsibility from the company, but there is mostly also a follow-up, a systematic follow-up that needs to be done by inspectors to make sure that what the timelines that have been agreed are respected or the actions are taken and it's not left in a, co in a, in a cupboard and forgotten. So that's, I think it's, it's a very active uh, monitoring. Thank you. I think we have another question, which is um, in case specific products or CAPA cases are identified, for more detailed examination by the inspectors during preparation for the inspection, should the manufacturer be informed on the specific points of interest before the inspection or only once the inspection has started? It's a very interesting question also. And again, it will um, depend on the objectives of uh, the inspection. Um, so if there are any evidences or any suspicion that there might be non-compliance in that specific point, uh, it might be more useful for the, the inspectorate not to um, identify in advance those specific points. If on the other hand, um, the authority will be concerned of the potential impact of this specific points and needs to assess all the available documents that might take time in the inspection setting to get, um, it might be useful to in advance say to the company, so we will have to want to look at this specific process, at this specific product so that the company then can gather all relevant information they have um, to evidence to inspectors that uh, they are um, applying GMP and are in compliance with GMP. So uh, again, it, it will have to be on, on a case by case uh, uh, basis and depend on, on the objectives of the inspection. If it is a routine inspection in principle, um, it could be useful to inform the manufacturer in advance uh, so that they can gather all the relevant risk assessments, all the, the relevant documents they have, all the relevant SMEs so that they are available in that specific day. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. I think that it covered the topic. And we have a new question. Thank you very much, everybody, for asking questions. This is really what, what we want to see. Uh, how can you assess the inspector's behavior? That's an interesting one as well. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's it's important um, to, to assess the inspector behavior and the inspector, uh, I, I, I think, should always strive to have uh, the, the adequate behavior. Um, this can be done on a multitude of, of levels. Um, most of the time it's important, and we talked about the qualification and, and, and the, the requirements for a qualification of inspectors. It's important also that the inspector is assessed um, routinely within the quality system of the inspectorate. So um, as part of the qualification, for example, you might be subjected um, every year or every two years or every three years, depending on the state of qualification you have. And uh, since when you are performing inspection activities, you might have um, an observer in, on the inspection that will be there to uh, assess your behavior and assess uh, your competencies and, and uh, in order to, to give you output of, of on the qualification status uh, and also on um, the, the anything you might need to, to improve. So um, this is a possible way to assess uh, the, the inspector's behavior as part of the qualification process that each inspectorate will have in the quality system to have uh, at a given frequency observed inspections by colleagues, just to know um, if, if the behavior is correct, if it's according to the procedures. So it might be um, a possibility. There are others, but this can be one solution. We can also consider, for example, feedback from, from the, 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 the inspectees, but as you know, that might be biased in some way. So uh, we need to have uh, um, here uh, the right approach. Yeah, I think that what you describe is a mix of competence that are maintained, integrity, but also a positive state of mind to try to get the best out of the company on the manufacturing side. So you, you get the information you need in order to G verify GM compliance. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions uh, from our colleagues? Even take the floor if you want to ask your question verbally. Do Please don't be shy, colleagues. Have, yeah, do you have more uh, cases or um, a slide? So we, we had prepared a, a slide, though. Okay. Um, if if uh, it could be um, now. Yeah, maybe we'll move to the to the slide that may trigger also some some points for discussion. Thank you very much. Colleagues, for those who were not there at the first session, just a reminder, you go either by uh, uh, checking the QR code directly with your, your phone or your uh, computer, or you go to slido.com as a website and you enter the number below and you will be faced with uh, questions that you can choose and uh, you can choose the answer, the proposed answer, and we will discuss the, um, uh, the answers and the possibilities. There is no right or wrong answer. It's more the scientific discussion and the reflection on how we address questions. So here's the first question. Antonio, we give them a little bit of time. And I expect we will see if uh, inspectors, inspection attendees can do better than the um, uh, risk management plan attendees where we had 40 responses. So up to you to do better than 40. Thank you. We, we have 100 uh, participants, more than 100 participants, so we should get some answers. Yeah, and it's like, I mean, it's like you were saying, there's no right or wrong answer. It's uh, really to foster a little bit of discussion and share any, any concerns or, or uh, any queries. So we are on 13. I think we can do better than that. Very good. So we, we can see that um, the majority of, of colleagues that have joined us have uh, um, in place a, a QRM tool uh, to, to, for, for planning purposes. Um, still, 14% um, um, do, do not have it. Um, just to remind that it's uh, very important and it's something that could be considered to, to define this, this type of quality risk management tool. Um, 
even to use uh, the tool that that is used at European level and it's described in the compilation because it's very um, useful for planning purposes and and uh, it's very important for us to plan the inspections not based not on on um, closed cycles or, or rigid cycles but uh, to be flexible according to the risk of um, any given site and it's an invitation for those uh, that do not have uh, such a tool for planning to, to try and implement it that it will be something that will um, increase your your general overview of, of the, the GMP compliance of, of the manufacturers and it will be very useful in, in planning because sometimes if you say we're going to do inspections every two years there are sites that might not need um, such a routine inspections and you, you are um, the, the resources can be maximized in other way uh, towards sites that in fact need um, more more routine um, assessment so but to, we are happy that uh, most most of the, the participants have uh, such a tool. And please, um, if you're not aware of the EU tool, consult the compilation and, and consider it as, for example, as a starting point, because it's it's very useful. I don't know if, if you have any questions in this regard that you might want to pose. Um, please feel free to take the floor, don't, don't be shy. It's important that we, we, we discuss um, everything that might be important to you. Very good. So we do not, do not have any questions. So perhaps we, we go to the next um, Slido um, query. Do you have a procedure for qualification and training of inspectors? Antonio, while people are answering that question, um, is there a way we can maybe share the procedure, the draft procedure? So, or is it something that is accessible to the this uh, IPA countries because that would help them maybe set up the procedure? Or um, is there a model we can we can share? Yes, and yes, yes. Uh, um, I as I mentioned uh, during the presentation, this, these uh, models and most of these procedures that were uh, discussed are a part of the compilation of community procedures. This is a publicly as accessible document. Um, it is available for, for any colleague that might want to consult it um, and, and might use it um, because it's, it's important not only to harmonize, but especially to give you an idea of, of where to start and how to adapt to use specific inspectorate and uh, these possibilities. We know that there are a number of idiosyncrasies for each uh, specific inspectorate, but uh, it can be used by colleagues from, from accessing countries as a starting point and it's it's um, accessible. Uh, I, I, can, I can share uh, also, I will put in the presentation the link and then the colleagues will be able to access it and I'm sure if they need any help, they, they can reach us and, and we, we surely will, will provide feedback. Um, thank you, thank you, Inez. Um, again, this, this um, the procedure for qualification and training, we see that there is more or less a parallelism with the, with the previous question regarding um, the, the planning. So um, the majority has a procedure for qualification and training. Uh, some of the colleagues um, do not have that, that scope um, and that in place. Again, this was just to underline and remember uh, to make the colleagues aware that it's very important also to have a um, qualification process and to have a training for inspectors. So initial training and continuous, continuous training, because we know the state of the art, uh, it's always evolving from a regulatory standpoint and from a manufacturing standpoint. So it's important to keep updated and to have inspectors performing inspections that have um, knowledge regarding uh, auditing and quality systems um, and uh, SOPs and especially uh, GMP guidance. So, um, and to have this replicated uh, to each new colleague that comes. Um, so it's again, just to, to invite you, uh, we know the time is also 
very scarce, but um, it's something that should be um, contemplated uh, to have this type of procedure. And again, uh, the compilation has the union procedures for that. And again, you can, uh, it might be useful to adapt to, to the specific circumstances, but to have this starting point. Um, so um, that, that would be um, why this, this question is here. I don't know if colleagues have any query or anything they want to, to share with us in the scope of this question. Alexandra? Well, Alexandra, I saw you're, you're, you're unmuted, so I thought you were, you wanted to ask a question. Feel free, feel free. Uh, other people, just take the floor, please. Uh, this is supposed to be a dialogue, so really, I don't hesitate, even if the question seems quite simple. Just ask it. Other colleagues will benefit from your, your question. Please, Alexandra, I don't know if you want to, to if we're having technical difficulties with you or if you want to, uh, uh, or, or if you, you want to pose a question. Alexandra Labudovic? Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. I think we, we, we can move on to the next yeah. question, uh, Agnes. So this is uh, regarding the distant assessment. So it's a tool that's fairly popular right now. Um, the procedures in the EU um, or, or the, the, the possibility has been there for some time. Now it is being more used. And I think it would be interesting to have your um, approach on this. And how are you dealing with these constraints? This is a very important topic. We are looking at that at different level at the ICMRA, the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities, to try to and the, to try to identify and also at PICS to try to identify the elements that are sustainable that should remain as facilitating good quality inspection, but at the same time not cutting corners and not uh, compromising on the uh, evidence and the way to assess. But I think it's a, it's an important topic that will evolve with time. So we will learn from the experience of COVID and we will actually benefit from that, that discussion. I know there is some resistance because some people feel that it's actually not as good as a, an on-site inspection. But I think we have identified some of the benefits because the remote preparation for remote meeting preparation has allowed more people to, to join and to participate. I just also wanted to draw a parallel with the FDA process. The uh, GMP inspection uh, is always performed in presence of the assessors the quality assessors. And I think this is something we should really consider in Europe to try to facilitate the transfer of information between the GMP inspection and the quality assessment, initial assessment. And I think there is, there is benefit of doing this. It's a little heavier, of course, but at the same time, a, we can imagine that, and we can see that there are, there are a, a thing that would be done better if there was more collaboration at, at this level. So I think we have to learn from the good example of our neighbors and uh, partners in uh, MRA, not in crime, in MRA. Back to you, Antonio. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes, for that, that very uh, important uh, um, discussion. This is uh, obviously something that, uh, as you said, uh, there's not only negative aspects to COVID. We, we, we need to draw the, the positive uh, um, experiences we gather and, and the, the, the way we adapt uh, when we go forward. Um, this question was was to assess what what colleagues are doing and, and based on what and it's uh, it's important to see that um not a majority but most um are are performing distant assessments and do have a procedure so on the one hand distant assessments are important because like Agnes was saying it allow us to have still a level of supervision and to know what what is happening and the concerns and and also for for, for the, the, the the stakeholders to know that we are uh, still um, uh, maintaining uh, the supervision and assessing the, the GMP compliance level so 
we, we it's pleasing to know that 43% of you do it and do it based on the procedure. Obviously, the procedure it's very important to have to, to replicate in all occasions and for all the inspectors to know how to do it and and, and based on what what to assess. Um, but I also, uh, for for 39% of the colleagues are not performing them and um, do not have a procedure. So this is something that might deserve your attention. Perhaps you're doing um, uh, already on-site inspections, but nevertheless, at the moment, they can be very limited depending on, on the specific um, health, health concerns and, and requirements in place in your area. But consider also this distant assessments that might be a useful tool uh, in filling the gaps in, in, in oversight and, and um, use it when when on-site inspections might not be possible because of, of COVID and, and or other contingencies. Um, then 17% uh, are doing it uh, without a procedure. Again, the, this crisis has caught some of us by surprise and the time, uh, again, Priorities might have not allowed to to draft the procedure yet, but also it's important to to draft the procedure when when time is there and availability and to implement it within the, the quality system so that the procedure is controlled and we, you always do it uh, based on that procedure. And uh, um, no, th th those were all the, all, all the answers. Um, I don't know if regarding distant assessments, colleagues have any uh, feedback they want to provide, any question, any if they want to share with, with uh, all the participants their experience, um, please um, take the floor. Uh, again, don't be shy. Um, Antonio, um, I have a question about, uh, again, distant assessment and uh, um, the risk-based approach on planning of inspection we were talking about before. Uh, uh, do you think that uh, a distant assessment uh, could uh, could be used in uh, on the co in the context? Uh, I mean, apart from COVID and other uh, emergencies in general, could be used for uh, um, in the risk-based approach. I mean, I think that probably if there were um, the frequency of of inspection for a for Every site could be, uh, let's say, um, decreased if there uh, there was a distant assessment. So we could think maybe of a of an inspection and then uh, the next inspection after uh, three years instead of two. If in the meantime there is a there is a distant assessment, do you think it's uh, it's something that we should think about in the future? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricardo, for that question. Um, yeah, I, 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 I do think that is something that um, has to be pondered for incorporation uh, in in the in the uh, in the risk based planning, um, and and the reflection has to be given on how it will be incorporated. Uh, obviously, the information that is gathered on a distant assessment is very important and can allow us for some confidence regarding the GMP compliance of that um, site. And again, to maximize resources could be encompassed in the risk-based planning to focus the resources on, on more important um, uh, manufacturers. Um, a number of, of possible ways going forward uh, are under discussion uh, and, and are being assessed, um, distant assessments, the hybrid inspections, um, a number of possibilities, but they, they will have to be, I think, incorporated in, in, the, in the planning tool. Um, as of now, um, uh, an on-site inspection has to be performed following uh, when conditions allow it. But um, I believe uh, I agree with you, Ricardo, that this could be also a very useful tool um, to 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 uh, give input. Uh, so the, the the results of the distance assessment to be considered in inspection planning. I'm thinking, for example, of sites that will do only um, uh, batch certification activities, only the QP. So uh, can a distant assessment in a case like this uh, replace uh, um, 
an on-site inspection. So physically, with the systems we have in place now, um, very few things will be uh, physically available or archived. And uh, um, there is a case there and in other types of, of inspections, other activities that that um, we might uh, um, have uh, this, this possibility going forward. And it's something we might use, but um, obviously it should be agreed. Um, and also other point you touch, I think could be very important um, this uh, to, to perform distant assessments uh, and and uh, it might be possible sometimes, in my opinion, to have distant assessments of different parts of the system um, or, or to have more frequent supervision, but uh, with less scope. So um, uh, try to have, because I think some inspections are, sites are getting so um, big and uh, so complex that it might be useful uh, to do more frequent inspections with less scope. So to see uh, areas at the time, topics at the time, always taking into account um, the global picture, like we mentioned. But distant assessments, again, here could be uh, used um, uh, for, for, for to, to weigh this. And uh, I agree that um, there should be a way they could be considered in 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 the uh, in the in the risk based planning and perhaps when the, when the dust settles that will be the case um, hopefully but also very important point thank you thank you we have a hand raised by uh, Stefan Spiteri Stefan could you take the floor please and then we have a question in the chat but uh, let's start by the thank you are you hearing me please yes very well okay thank you. Uh, my question is um, uh, partly related with remote uh, inspection. Um, I would like to ask you whether there is um, some kind of procedure whereby when a GMP certificate expires after three years and it's not possible to uh, carry out an inspection, um, if there is a possibility to extend the GMP certificate for one or two months or maximum three months until a proper inspection, uh, on-site inspection is carried out. Thank you, Stefan, for, for your query. It's it's very important and very relevant. At EU level, we have developed um, agreement between member states that all uh, certificates that are uh, in the GMDP um, would have been and have been uh, extended automatically until the end of 2021. Um, there might be further um, uh, automatic extensions in the future, depending also on um, on the, the the way the pandemic goes. But this is a possibility, Stefan, and and it's something that has been done yet, because. Um, at the same time, we, we need, there's an expiry for, for the certificate, but we cannot have the risk of uh, the medicines, especially the critical medicines, not reaching the patient, not reaching the market. So um, it's important to have these tools um, to extend the certificates. That being said, this will depend um, obviously on the legal framework you have in place at your uh, specific uh, um, uh, state and how you can adapt that. But it's something that in Europe has been done. I don't know if you, if I answered yes. your query. Yes, uh, very much so. Just one last query, please. Um, and apologies for my lack of knowledge at the at the at the stage. Um, is there any commission or um, a guideline where it says? that all the certificates on the UDRA has been, have been extended till 2021. And if there is, where can I find it, please? Yes, Stefan, no, no, no problem. Um, it is predicted in the um, exceptional measures for COVID in the regulatory um, uh, framework for, for COVID. Um, so if you go to the EMA webpage and look the COVID section, there's uh, um, a Q&A um, &A on the, the exceptional regulatory provisions for uh, during COVID, and it is predicted there, Stefan. And also, if you go to the UDRA GMDP database, you will find um, below a note that will indicate that, uh, please note that all uh, GMP certificates due to COVID have been extended until the end of 2021. Okay, process has taken place because of COVID. Of course, it is not a systematic thing. It's just because of the pandemic and the uh, impossibility to travel, to do on-site inspection and so on. But at the same time, it shows that when the circumstances require it, we are able to be flexible and, again, thinking risk-based, 
there are certain elements that we can accept because they are they are justified. Uh, we have a question on the minimum qualification and training per year for our GMP inspectors, Antonio. Thank you, thank you, Agnes. Thank you, Miliana, for the question. Well, um, that uh, it is important that the qualification and training uh, requisites are defined in the quality system of the inspectorate. However, what those requirements will be will uh, need to be assessed by each individual inspectorate. So in our uh, European um, procedure, um, again, in the compilation, I invite you to, to go look uh, at it um, as a, a minimum set of requirements, uh, like I told you, knowledge on GMP, um, knowledge on quality systems, um, a number of, of provisions, but it has, it, it, you need to adapt it to your specific inspectorate. Obviously, these kind of basic um, training and qualification aspects must be there. Um, the knowledge of, of uh, ISO, uh, the knowledge of the GMP guidance, um, for example, inspection techniques uh, and the training also. But, uh, and, and you say that you could have, uh, um, you need to be uh, of server uh, in five inspections, for example, for a given dosage form to be then a supporting inspector and then five more inspections, you can be a lead inspector and then you go to sterile uh, processing and so on. But this will depend on, on the circumstances of your particular inspectorate because it might not be adequate for you to say so to qualify an inspector you need to perform 10 inspections because every two years for example because you, there might not be 10 inspections where you can go every two years so you need to adapt based on your on your specific circumstances um, and again please see uh, the EU procedure and, and start from that you don't have to, to do it the same but start and try to adapt to your specific uh, situation in your specific um, territory and, and uh, make them reasonable. So if you see that uh, your your workload will be, you, if you have to manage 20 inspection, twenty GMP inspections per year and you have five GMP inspectors in order to requalify them, for example, it might not be wise to, to say that each of them will have to perform 10 inspections because they will, won't perform 10 inspections per year because the number is reduced. So um, it's based on, it's a case by case rationale and um, it's important that it is adapted and it is not a, a rigid system that as you go, you improve it and, and adapt it even more um, to, 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 to your specific circumstances evolve as you go. Um, no, Miana, if, if that was useful. You, um, I don't see any more questions. Anybody wants to have a, a last uh, request, clarification, experience to share? Just take the floor, please. But uh, thank you very much, Antonio. In the meantime, it was really very clear, very precise, and uh, based on experience. So it's really, really good to 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 hear that. Thank you very much. I think this was a very highly requested uh, webinar. So thank you for, for being there. We will share the links. And of course, as I said, the presentation, but mostly the, the webinar themselves are recorded. So they will be put on the EMA channel of YouTube where you can access them. We will accept them, sorry. We will inform you when they are ready because it takes a couple of weeks to, to make them ready. And uh, so, and I want again to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Clément and uh, Sandra, who are in the background uh, uh, supporting this uh, webinar. Thank you again, Antonio and your colleagues for the uh, co good collaboration uh, with International Affairs. Thank you to Ricardo, who has been uh, managing the preparation of this meeting. And uh, thank you to the audience for being very active. Uh, we only got 25 responses. Next time, I hope you can do more. But uh, thank you very much. Antonio, I'll give you the last final word. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Just, no, just to thank you uh, and EMA International for the, the invitation and thank all the colleagues that were able to join us today. And uh, I think it's very uh, refreshing to have this open dialogue and to clear uh, any doubts or expectations. And I think from our part, we are always open to, to help you and, and in whatever way is possible. So um, please, uh, um, thank you for, for, for uh, coming and hope you have enjoyed it.
Thank you, everybody, and uh, goodbye. Have a good day, a good weekend, and uh, please continue to work for public health. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, we, we, before we we close, uh, maybe we should say goodbye to Agnes. Do you want to? Uh, who is? Yeah, uh, who thank won't you. be? Thank you, Ricardo. <laughs> because she is retiring, so probably... I can, I can explain. Thank you, Ricardo. Yes, I, I am retiring in two in two weeks. And so it was my last uh, sharing of those webinars. I very, uh, like very much this uh, exercise of uh, facilitating uh, the collaboration with the um, IPA project and the IPA countries. So thank you very much. I will enjoy my time. I will not work, so that's great. And after two years of COVID, it's, it's welcome. But thank you and good luck to all the accessing and candidate countries because you still have some work to do. But uh, please let, let me reassure you that we will help you all the way to uh, joining the EU. Thank you and goodbye.